for all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. Okay, looks like we are live, guys. Thank you for your patience. I am pumped for this. We've already got some super stickers, questions, and super chats flying in. So thank you so much, guys. I'll get to those first because I know the chat's going to be lively and these are going to be flying by before I can get to them. So Jamie, I appreciate it, brother. Amen. Amen. Well said. And there's another one up above. I think it's already gone, but make sure you're tagging me. And now that we're actually live, I'll be able to click save before I lose them. Um, but anyways, I want to point out that tonight is, is an extremely exciting event. I've personally been looking forward to this one since we scheduled it over a week ago. We are blessed tonight to have Dr. Jonathan Sarfati on the show again for this very important topic. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Sarfati, for giving us your time. Actually, you're muted right now if you wanted to unmute yourself and the audio should kick in for you. Okay, good. Awesome. I wanted to point out, yeah, sounds good. I wanted to point out um, that you have helped not only us who, who run this ministry, but also our awesome audience. Our last interview with you was incredibly informative and we touched on so many amazing topics. You know, I, in my opinion, you absolutely demolished old earth and, and evolutionism. So that was an awesome interview. Anybody who has not yet seen it, please check it out. And I also want to point out Dr. Sarfati, that I appreciate all the help that you gave us in the comment section following the interview with links and sources and so on. To be of assistance, I'm hoping to do the same there this time around too. Quite a different uh, round of uh, of topics this time, right? That's right. That's right. A very important topic, um, specifically on your book, Refuting Compromise. I've also got George here with me today for this much needed and very important interview. So, uh, brother George. Thank you for being here with me. Last time we had Raw Matt with us. Unfortunately, he won't be able to join us oh, today. Sorry. But uh, George, thank you for being here for the interview, my man. No, no problems from uh, one Aussie to the other. Good day, mate. Good day, mate. <laughs> and and, and true, true to my form, Dr. Safadi, I usually started off with a bit of humor. Did you know that Einstein developed a theory about space? And boy, it was about time, too. Oh, very good. That's a good one. <laughs> I like it. Mm. I've got a few. I've got a few actually, uh, but I'll mm. I'll save them for a bit later on. Awesome. Well, thank you, George. Yes, he's our team comedian, so we pay him the big bucks for that. Um, before we get right into the the, the questions, the important questions of the day, uh, refuting compromise, biblical compromise. Um, it, was there any words in terms of in, introduction? Dr. Sarfati, that, that you wanted to go say before we begin? Well, I mean, people seem to think this is some sort of um, divisive issue that people shouldn't fight about. But in fact, it's quite different in kind from the debates about baptism, uh, the millennium form of uh, church government. Um, well, see, all those things depend on the Bible being one's authority, and it's a matter of how, what does that, does that actually say? You've got people who believe the Bible on both sides, and they believe it's sufficient, and they believe it's authoritative. They're debating about what it means. But when it comes to the origins issue, it becomes a debate about whether the Bible is the authority, or should we regard secular science as our authority, the uniformitarian geology, the evolutionary biology. In practice, uh, when they try to, to do that, it's always they evolutionary biology the long ages that take precedence and the bible is underneath that you see so it's a question of authority so it's a, a debate that's different in kind not just degree from a lot of the other debates around amen amen i could not agree more um, I, th I think you laid it out perfectly why this is so important and that brings me i think to the um first question of the day. Um, I do want to point out to the audience that as always, though, we're going to make this interactive. So please tag me with your questions and I'll make sure I save them right away um, so they don't fly by before I can grab them. So I, I want to start off with what I believe is, is a very important question then, because we hear it over and over and over again. And I'd love to just dismantle it once and for all, dismantle it for good. Um, 
Many biblical compromisers have claimed that young earth creation is a new invention. <laughs> and they'll say that most of the church fathers, I know I'm, I'm already laughing, most of the church fathers and biblical scholars, they say, did not even believe in young earth creation and that they interpreted the days in Genesis as long periods of time. So my question, Dr. Sarfati, is this true? And if not, what is the best way to deal with these claims and arguments? I mean, always go to the original source. Don't uh, um, just because Hugh Ross says that someone said this, don't believe it. Go to what they actually said. And that's what I did in chapter three of Refuting Compromise. I went to the original sources and found that one of them was a young earth creationist, and most of them taught six ordinary days. I, mean, you know, I went through Basil the Great, uh, who said things like uh, he's doing a commentary on Genesis creation week and he says that 24 hours make up the space of a day and you find thomas aquinas uh, saying um, that, um, that the period of lights called the day because later on um a period of 24 hours is called day when it says there's evening and morning one day so it's just the sort of arguments that we were using is what thomas aquinas used uh, that uh, the day with an evening and morning and number means an ordinary day augustine said things like uh, uh that these long age people are deceived by highly mendacious documents that profess to give an age of many thousands of years past, but we know from Moses um, that the world's are under 6,000 years old. You see, they believe that the world was under 6,000 years old at the time of writing. And that's when you go through all these guys. They all believe for you too. Oh, uh, Dr. Sar, I think the, the the last maybe five words you said there kind of cut out. It, it could have been an issue with the with the headset there, but if it was important, I definitely want the audience to make sure that they heard it. Well, that link of this case is just be it shows that even uh, people on, on Hugh Ross's site have said, "Well, no, there wasn't anyone who believed in, in old Earth uh, before about the year eighteen hundred. Before then, people believed in a young Earth because that's what the Bible said." So right. The, ideas were invented as a reaction to try to appease the evolutionary long age ideas and try to make the bible fit it like day age and gap theory they are 19th century inventions right and then you have the framework hypothesis which is a 20th century invention then you have john walton with his cosmic temple that's in the 21st century so how come everyone overlooked these things throughout history and only just discovered them now when it's so convenient to try to accommodate the millions of years of uniformitarian geology long ages. Well, very well said, well put, because I find it funny that they're saying that young earth creation is a new invention when in fact all the biblical compromisers that they look to in those positions, right? Progressive uh, creationism, theistic evolution, John Walton's cosmic temple um, mm. arguments, all of these are, are what are modern inventions. These are new and, and novel and foreign to the church fathers for the most part. So uh, yeah, I, I find that, that pretty funny, you know, that, that they're the ones putting forth that argument. Uh, George, if you had a, a comment to make. Yeah, yeah. Can I add something? Um, it, it actually comes from uh, your book, uh, Dr. Sfati, The 15 Reasons to Take Genesis as History. We, we can all agree that uh, Moses wrote the first five five books of the uh, Old Testament. Mm -hmm. He clearly, he, like you rightfully stated, he clearly states what a day was. But yes. later on in Genesis, I believe he talks about Rebecca's descendants and he talks about a thousand million so if Moses actually wanted to portray the creation days as billions of years, surely he would have used the thousand million years instead of the yom. Well, see, he could have said things like, I mean, what he said to, to Abraham, if you can count the stars in the sky or the grains of sand on the seashore, um, that's how big your descendants will be. So he could have said, well, the, the universe has many years as the sands on the seashore. He could have used those sorts of comparisons to indicate a vast age, but he never did those things. It's almost like they're, they're saying that the ancient people are too stupid to understand about big numbers. Uh, yet, in fact, they had ideas about big numbers. They, they had words for them, but they also had comparisons with them. So, so yes, it's, it's really a strange idea. There were plenty of long age words that could have been used. They could have used 
things like olam, for instance, which means an age or eternity, but mostly it means an age. And there are other things in my book. I talk about some long age words that could have been used if, in fact, the author intended to teach that. But he didn't use any of those. Instead, he used a day with an evening, a morning, and number. And if, it's, if that's not um, straightforward enough, God himself told us what he meant. When he wrote the Ten Commandments, he said that you work for six days and rest for one day because uh, God created everything in six days and rested for one day. So it gives us a foundation for our work week. I mean, see, if the days were billions of years longer, that would be we'd have to work for six billion years and rest for one billion years, which is a bit of a long weekend <laughs> to look forward to. But so, I don't think so. <laughs> and also it means he must have done that work in history. See, the framework hypothesis and, and John Walton, they'll say, well, yes, it means 24 days, but it's not really days in history. But the fact is, it's only because God worked in history that we are supposed to work in space time as well, because God worked in space time. If God really hadn't done that work in six days, uh, why should we do, the, do it? Do you I think? Yeah. I was just going to say, it's not a question that, that I have written down or anything, but because you mentioned John Walton, and then you've also got Michael Heiser, this cosmic yeah. temple argument. Do you oh, find yeah. that convincing anyway? Because I, I feel like that's the arguments that are really popping up now on a lot of these YouTube channels. What are your thoughts in general on, on those? Well, see, the thing is that they want to compromise in billions of years, and they realize that all the other ways that they've tried to do don't work. So they're going to try and think of it other ways. I mean, the framework hypothesis, they, they understood that day age theory was nonsense of the Hebrew. So is the gap theory. So let's invent something else. Um, yeah, okay, it's literal days, but they're not days in history. Uh, John Walton also rejects Hugh Ross's uh, view of, of day age and the gap theory. So, oh, but we've got to appease the like, millions of years. So here's another idea. Yeah, this cosmic temple idea that's such a good point because i've seen a debate recently with um inspiring philosophy who, who oh, really, really he really just looks to john walton michael heiser and kind of repeats those arguments and he was putting forth the argument that yes he agrees that the days are literal but as you were saying, it looks like they're now realizing that the positions of like Hugh Ross and that these are not literal days, those are not defensible. So now they're just trying to look for something new. Well, yeah, see, it's also notable that these guys don't really understand the ancient Near East history. I've pasted a link in there by uh, the late Dr. Noel Weeks, who really was a professor of ancient history. It was his job. He was a historian by profession. He's been very critical uh, of the way Walton is using the ancient Near East, but not really understanding it properly. That's a good good article to 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 uh, to go to. But also, it's interesting. Even uh, someone like William Lane Craig, who's hardly a friend of the Earth position, also thinks they get it wrong by claiming that the ancient people believed in a hard dome above the Earth. Well, even William Lane Craig says no, they didn't because they knew that planets moved differently from the from the, the so-called fixed stars because they called the planets wandering stars. The word planet comes from Greek meaning wandering stars. They understood that planets were moving in different ways to the stars. So was the moon. So they knew it wasn't a fixed dome because you couldn't have that independent movement. So the ancients understood you got open space above us. Right. And you right. Know, all, all Walton's saying is, oh, all the ancient people was too stupid. They believed in a flat earth. They believed in a hard dome. Well, no, they didn't. It just doesn't make any sense. I'll point this link from uh, Craig uh, in the. I'm going to have a look uh, when we're yeah, over. I, I, I posted those links in the, in the chat for people. I'm so glad you brought that up because you hear arguments from, from their camp. And I've heard it in, in many recent debates where that's what they're saying. They're saying that, you know, the ancients, they actually did believe in this whole flat earth and this dome. And it, it, see, it almost seems like they're taking away from the inspiration. But as you said, they want to constantly point out that we don't understand the ancient Near Eastern context. But as you're pointing out, it's them who don't really understand it. They're not applying it correctly. Well, also, even so, the ancient Greeks, I mean, they use the word chaos, but the word chaos seems to be related to a word to mean gape. So it looks like even the, the ancient Greek mythology understood it was a very a large, open expanse and not a closed dome. Right. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. Uh, um, I'll get to a couple of these super chats that came in before I miss them. Doki Doki Bible Club, I appreciate it. Asks, why do theistic evolutionists think St. Augustine is their best friend? 
we haven't read him. We can probably go to take a few different things from him, but there's, there's no way he was an evolutionist because that's one thing he would not have accepted. Uh, he also believed in a young earth. That's very unambiguous. He he denounced the mendacious documents that, that taught millions of years or long periods of time, but without, um, he said, well, they had no clue because Moses has the correct time, which is under 6,000 years. I mean, he was, um, the world was 6,000 years or less when he wrote. Um, and in fact, we've got articles about a lot of myths about Augustine. He was the most, uh, oh, by Oregon and Augustine were the most allegorical of the early Christian writers, but they affirmed specifically a young earth. Right, right. That's a great point. Um, and, and George, I know you're going to have a question. So before we get to you, I'll just I'll, I'll throw this one up too, and then I'll be caught up on questions. This looks like it's it's an argument for the, the gap theory. Oh, good. Um, and I'm not sure if you've heard this one before. Can you address the perfect tense verb in Genesis 1-1 as a consecutive? I'm not really uh, familiar see, with this specific happens, argument. In the, in the Hebrew narrative, uh, what you have is you have the Kal perfect or Kal verb to start the narrative. So the bara is a vav, is, is actually a katal verb. It means God created. But after that, the verbs that continue the narrative forward are called vav consecutive, because consecutive means one thing after another. And they're also called vayiktol in the Hebrew grammars, because it means then he killed. That sort of verb, then he ate, then he killed, then he spoke, then he saw. That sort of verb. And, and that sort of verb runs right throughout Genesis 1 and 2 and the rest of it. This is the sort of verb that you see in the historical narrative parts of the Bible. So when you see it in Genesis, the original readers would have also understood Genesis to be a historical book. And that's how the New Testament authors and Jesus understood Genesis. They understood it as history as well. You just go through what they say in the New Testament. They believe that everything in Genesis is what it says. Now, Genesis 1, 2, you have a different sort of verb. It's called the Vav disjunctive. Now, what that does is takes a break in the sequential narrative and pauses and say, well, put something in brackets. You see, in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. Brackets here, the earth was formless and empty. So it pauses the narrative. Then it goes forward. Uh, and then, then God said, let there be light. And that's the Vav consecutive. Vayomer means it, it, God said, okay, let there be light and there was light. Vahi or that's another Vav consecutive. There was light is Vav consecutive. But the Genesis 2 doesn't have that verb, it has a disjunctive. And when you go to other parts of the scripture, um, what you find is that it always means a pause in the narrative because you have this case here where Gideon attacks the Midianite camps and the camp was unsuspecting. So you put it in brackets to see if the gap theory was right, you'd have to say. Gideon attacked the Midianite camp and they became unsuspecting. I think once they've been attacked, you're not going to be unsuspected anymore. Or you have Jonah go to Nineveh, bracket, Vav, disjunctive, and it was an exceedingly great city. But if the gap theorists are right, you'd have to translate that as Jonah came to Nineveh and became a great city. Right. That's a great point. That's a great point. See, the gap theorists want to say in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth, and the earth became formless and empty but as i said if you want to do that you have to do that with the gideon passage and the uh, jonah passage and it's also at the beginning of genesis uh, 13 there's a passage a lot of those sort of passages around it doesn't make any sense you have to say in the beginning god created the earth the heaven and the earth parenthesis the earth was formless and bent empty right. Right, go on let's move on no that's a great answer because to be honest with you that's how i've uh, always read it as well you know, before I even heard of the gap theory. And I've learned so much from you, Dr. Sarfati, on biblical hermeneutics and proper exegesis. And, and I always say, you know, we should be interpreting scripture with scripture. And yeah. what you've done there is you have corroborated the account of Genesis with Jesus Christ himself, our Lord and Savior, the Apostle Paul, and, and all the, you know, New Testament writers as well. That's proper, you know, hermeneutics right there so i appreciate that answer um I, I i'll get to my book, sorry i was going to say uh, my book the genesis account my my commentary on genesis 1 to 11 uh goes into this uh, grammatical analysis more deeply yeah no that's a great answer I, I appreciate that um so my next question here is because we kind of mentioned william lane craig earlier well in a recent mm -hmm. video that i've seen being shared around 
William Lane Craig, he claimed that when you do a sensitive genre analysis of Genesis 1 to 11, Mm-hmm. It suggests that we are not dealing with a straightforward historical narrative, but word for word, he said it is a mytho history. Do you believe there's any legitimacy or v- validity to this argument from uh, Craig? No, actually, uh, you should look at some of our, in our website. It's not from our website. I pasted it in there just now. Of course, you're probably running a bit behind me, what you're seeing, what the audience is seeing behind me, but uh, I'm pasting this in now. And if you search in our search button for Craig, you'll find about three articles I've written um, replying to Craig, including that one. And some of my colleagues have responded to Craig more recently. But the problem is, um, remember when Peter was evangelizing, he said, we do not follow cleverly devised myths. What we are teaching is history. Uh, but Craig would have us believe that Genesis is a cleverly de- de- um, devised myth, which I find totally unacceptable because Jesus and the apostles taught it as real history. Uh, when Jesus was warning about the judgment, he went back to the flood narrative. He said, as it was in the days of Noah, and he affirms the flood was real, the ark was real. And then he teaches about marriage as man, one man and one woman, he goes back to Genesis 1, 27 and 2, 24, again, quotes it as real history, a real man and woman that God created at the beginning, not billions of years after the beginning. OK, so every time they refer to Genesis, they, they treat it as straightforward history. They expect their readers to understand it as straightforward history. They expect the readers to have been taught about Genesis in their uh, the discipleship in the early church. OK, uh, so Jesus and the apostles believed Genesis was real history, not mytho history. And then the grammar of Genesis makes it very clear that it's meant to be historical and not poetic or allegorical. That's the valve consecutives I went through just bef- just earlier. Well, while we're on uh, William Lane Craig, Dr. Safadi, um, one yeah. of his other main arguments for his claim that humans were probably not specially created by God as a result of... Um, being unrelated, uh, being unrelated to great apes, is mm-hmm. that humans and chimpanzees share broken genes or genetic mistakes. Is there any validity to his argument as it is enough for us to reject the independent origins of Adam and Eve in the beginning of creation? Well, the point is, I mean, he seems to be very behind in genetics because at one time uh, people thought there uh, was 97% junk DNA, but now they know that junk DNA is doing something. It's being transcribed into RNA, which is very important to regulate genes. So there were 97% of it's actually transcribed and they can prove it's transcribed. It's not junk. It's doing something. It's part of the uh, immensely complicated genetic coding system that we have. Uh, that's what the junk, the so-called junk is doing. And also there are some spots in the genome which are a bit more prone to uh, mutations than other spots. So that's why we have, uh, that if in fact it is a mistake, and that's what I'm not necessarily going to agree with him on, if it is a mistake, there are some places which are more prone to mutations than others. So that's what you've got there. Uh, what's the usual thing, the gulo gene for uh, vitamin C production, that's supposed to be a shared mistake. Now, we wrote about shared mistakes quite some time ago, so I'm surprised he hasn't really caught up with the, needs to get with the program, really. Because, I'm, uh, I'm, just wondering, I'm just wondering where he gets his information from and whether he looks at both sides of the story. He doesn't look at our side of the story. That's the problem. He, he seems to, to have he's into my Genesis commentary when he can try and... Uh, pull something out of context and say there's something wrong there, which I've actually answered in another part of the commentary. That's what he's done. And in the same way that he's this um, inspiring philosophy, he, he knocks down straw men all the time. We're going to have an article responding to that on, on creation.com um, in, a, in a few days as well. Because, again, he uh, the honest thing to do with a position is to try to address the strongest arguments for it. They don't seem to do that. Well, well uh, at TMI, we do that. We, we actually address Richard Dawkins, leading evolutionist atheist. We address Hugh Ross, leading progressive creation. We, we address Don, John Walton, who is the, the leading idea of this, of this cosmic temple thing. We try to address the strongest arguments. We never do the same to us. Well, not uh, only are you... Actually, real quick, George, if, if I could just oh, jump okay. in real quick, just because cool. I, I, I'm mostly hearing everything you're saying, Dr. Sarfati, but it's so important that I want the audience to catch everything. I'm wondering if 
it's a headset issue. I know the last time you were with us, you were using just the computer audio. It seems like it's it, it, it'll go clear for maybe a minute and then it'll oh. go 20 seconds of kind of muffle. But it, it kind of sounds like it's a headset issue though. And I, I don't know if there's anything we can do to improve mm. it. I'm or listening trying. to you through this, okay? Uh, I haven't got a microphone, unfortunately, but I do have these headphones, so that's what I'm using to hear you guys, but uh, I, I don't have anything to, to return the favor, sorry. Okay, okay. I'll have to get one uh, next time we, we do this. I have to have a microphone with me, so the best thing I can do. Yeah, no, no, no problem, no problem. This will this will do it. And like I said, we, we can still hear you, but I just noticed a couple comments in the audience. So um, okay. I, I apologize, George. You were going to say something? Oh, yeah, yeah. I was just going to add, uh, Dr. Safari is obviously good at playing chess blindfolded, but he also read my mind then because I was actually going to ask him a question about <laughs> inspiring philosophy. Uh, you probably yeah. would have seen uh, one of his recent videos uh, titled oh, Top yeah. 10 Biblical Problems for Young Earth Creationists. Now, oh, yeah. he, he, he makes several arguments with one of them having to do with Genesis 17:17. 17, 17. And the story of Abraham and Sarah, the, the mm -hmm. argument goes like this. Uh, why is Abraham, Abraham laughing at at prospect of having a child at age 100? Terah allegedly fathered Abraham at 130. So mm. if, you, if you can respond to that. Well, I mean, I don't see the problem here because Abraham presumably knew his, his father lived a long age, but he also would have known that his fairly close ancestors were declining in lifespan. So he actually would have known that uh, the lifespan was declining. You see later on when you go to Jacob, Abraham's grandson, and he said, the days of my sojourning are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of my life and not attained to the days of the years of my life of the fathers and the day of their sojourn, sojourning. So he actually seemed to know that uh, lifespan was declining. So, I mean, Abraham lived to 175, uh, Isaac to 180, uh, but Jacob only lived to 147. So he seemed to realize that, that he was not living as long as his father or grandfather were. Okay, that's one thing. Isaac also thought he was approaching death at 133 because he's gone blind, but he actually had 47 more years to live. You remember when he was um, leaving his inheritance his blessing to, to, to Esau he tried to and, got, and gave it to Jacob instead but he actually had 47 more years to go so it looks like people were realizing that there were some much older people in a not so distant ancestry and Christians and Jews have just yawned about this for a long time because it's quite common for, from Christians and Jews uh, they would say that Melchizedek in Genesis 14 was actually Shem. That was quite a common view in Jewish and Christian exodus. They, they understood that people were living a lot longer and could have overlapped their lifespan. This inspiring philosophy person thinks it's a big problem, but the ancient Jews and Christians didn't think of it as a problem. But why is it a problem now? It hasn't been a problem for the church in, in most of its history, but now it becomes a problem. Right. Yeah. I mean, Abraham is also called the Hebrew, which in uh, in Genesis 40, you know, the thing about with, with Melchizedek, Abraham is called the Abraham the Hebrew, which actually really means Abraham the Eberite. Now, Eber would have been one of the oldest people in the, on, in the world at that time. So maybe as far as the ancestry of Abraham, he, he related himself to Shem and to Eber, and these are the people who would have still been alive in those days, the oldest people in his ancestry, still alive, very many generations above him, but they were still alive, so he would identify with those those patriarchs who were still living at the time. Why is it a problem? And I think the difficulty is probably more, uh, we know even nowadays, uh, women lose childbearing much earlier than men do. What, okay, one of the so, things I've, sorry, Sarah probably had menopause. So that's why both of them are laughing. Is, is really about Sarah being too old because she's gone through menopause. Right. That's a oh, great I, response. I'm sorry. Go ahead, George. I, I was just going to add, Dr. Sfardi, um I think you've probably seen uh, some of the lectures that uh, Dr. Samford has given, and he always yeah. uses the, um, the lifespans um, after the flood which uh, shows a statistical analysis with an R squared value of 0.9. Now, I'm an engineer, and, and we did some mm -hmm. statistical analysis in our university, and I know a, an R squared value of 0.9 is quite an accurate um, mm. a prediction or, yeah. or, or fit of that data. And um, 
it just goes to support the genetic entropy uh, example because how could how could these supposedly goat herders mm -hmm. write this information over hundreds to thousands of years and get that R squared value so so perfectly correct? Well, so they, they might say age is a symbolic, but what symbolic of what we never hear? I mean, there's no no indication in the Bible that they're anything but ordinary ages. And as you say, um, the the Sanford's work about so this exponential decay of a population that's gone through a big stress is a big part of that. And the other part of that is that Noah was a very old father. So he was 500 years before he had Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Uh, and the thing is, as men, see, women uh, have most of their eggs in suspended animation from the time they're in the mother's womb. You see, a woman pregnant with a daughter actually has a grandparent's, her granddaughter's eggs inside her, okay? That's quite an amazing thing. But see, men keep on generating sperm cells uh, throughout their lifespan. But the longer, the older you are, uh, you the older, the more mutations you'd have in your, your sperm cells, which we pass on to the next generation, which is why I think Shem had a much shorter lifespan than all his people, his predecessors. See, I think that's the, that's the thing we've got to understand. The, any explanation of lifespan must explain why Noah lived a third of his life um, after the flood, but lived in 150. But then Shem, who was born before the bottleneck, actually had a much shorter lifespan. So I think the, the fact of Noah being a very old father has a lot to do with it. And then you've got the explanation. Since with modern genetics, it doesn't make any sense of saying they're symbolic of some unknown thing, which is what they have to do. Right, right. That's a great response. You know, they say it's symbolic and yet it just so happened to perfectly match up to a biological decay curve, as, as you guys were talking about, which, by the way, I'd like to point out that these biblical compromisers, I've never once seen them even come close to debunking the science of genetic entropy that corroborates the biblical account and, and the genealogies and, and the, you know, decrease in age. So, yeah, I, I don't find that convincing. I think that's a that's a great response. Um, I mean, they could actually, have made up the exponential decay curve. That's the thing. Everything about it just doesn't something you wouldn't make up. Uh, it makes no right. sense to make it up, but it makes sense. In fact, they were decaying exponentially, as we see. Yeah, I think I, I think you kind of just answered this then, because that was a really comprehensive answer. Because the next question was is you know a similar argument. Inspiring philosophy made the same argument in his video about Abraham. And he said, almost word for word, he said, why is Abraham called an old man if he died much younger than his ancestors and lived mm. less than his son Isaac, right? Yeah, old relative to what? Relative to the expected lifespan in that stage of history, yeah. Right, exactly. I think you, I think you uh, nailed it, Dr. Sarfati, when you said, you know, it wasn't a problem for all of these years throughout church history. But suddenly it's a problem now, you know, and, and typically a, a new doctrine or a new problem that just pops up now in 2020, 20, you know, that that's concerned that, you know, this is probably a false teaching or, or false doctrine. And now, uh, see, that's the thing. I mean, I've found a lot of these things, like these people who say, what about days before the sun? But the, the church fathers uh, understood that uh, there was light and plants before the sun. They used this history to explain why pagan sun worship was no good because they said, well, hang on, God, the true God uh, made plants to grow before the sun. So worship the creator of the sun. Don't worship the sun. Stop your silly sun worship. Worship the one who made the sun before, uh, after he made the vegetables. Okay, so, they, so this is uh, something church fathers and reformers understood, but now it's been raised as something that, um, that's something creationists have never thought of. And the Cain's wife thing, we've got records in the fifth century uh, of people answering the Cain's wife question. So, I mean, a lot of this is thing is, should be a total yawn because it was dealt with by the church fathers, by the, by the Thomas Aquinas, by the reformers long ago. And some, somehow there's supposed to be unanswerable uh, there's supposed to be unanswerable questions that we have. Well, we, we can we can quote uh, two Peter three uh, about scoffers. Uh, I guess inspiring philosophy actually scoffs at the uh, worldwide flood, pointing um, to Genesis eight verse four to five that reads that the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. 
Uh, this is a uh, fairly wind, so just stay with me here. Yeah? It also says that the tops of the mountains were seen. He then yeah. points to Genesis 8, 9, that indicates the dove sent out by Noah had no place to set her foot and return to the ark because the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. He then goes on to say, this is uh, inspiring philosophy, this is a contradiction, he says, to a global flood interpretation because the text cannot then literally mean the entire earth was covered. He essentially says the flood account may just be hyperbolic and indicate a local or regional flood. Is there any validity to this argument of his? It's, I mean, again, it's something that people are, are supposed that the creators have never seen this before, but in fact, there's an article in the post uh, about this. This argument being answered. You've got a global flood at first, and everything is covered, including the high mountains. All the high mountains were covered. You see, the Bible is very clear about that. But as the, the water sank down, you're going to see the mountaintops exposed. But the most of the flood, the earth was still covered, but you still got some mountaintops that exposed a minority uh, after the, the flood has already come down quite a lot. Okay. Um, when you look at the order of the animals that were sent out, the dove, uh, the the uh, the raven has to eat carrion, okay? So it's a, it's a bit not as fussy as the dove. So the raven's the best thing to send out. Then you have the dove sent out, which doesn't eat carrion. It's a plant eater, but it also likes uh, to have a fairly clean, dry place to, to, to rest. Uh, so, that, so when you look at the, what it would do, um, and eventually the, the, the dove came back with an olive uh, branch. So that's a thing because... The, the olive tree propagates vegetatively, you see. It doesn't have to propagate from seeds. It propagates vegetatively, it's like from cuttings. It can do that. As Paul talks about the, the olive tree and being grafted in. See, Paul uses the olive tree uh, to, to symbolize the place of blessing and, and the, the Gentiles being grafted in, okay, that sort of thing here. And that's what happened with, with the dove getting the olive branch. And eventually it didn't come back because it found a, a, a nice... A clean spot to live okay so everything about that makes sense of a real global flood uh, a local flood doesn't make any sense whatsoever because i mean why would you bother building an ark in the first place to escape a local flood just by great like lot did from sodom i mean why stick around why, why don't get, get the birds to fly away I mean, it exactly. makes sense. It's a lot of trouble to go to if it's just a local flood. I mean, God puts all this universal language into the flood. I mean, how do you miss things like the, the uh, all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered? You see, you've got this what's called a double coal construction. Coal meaning all in Hebrew. And you don't have that double coal unless you're talking about a literal universal, a single coal sometime, but not the double coal, all the high mountains under the entire earth, under the entire heavens. And then you got everything um, was killed, all the people, all the animals, nothing uh, was alive except those on the ark. You've got this incredible pileup of universal language. And how do you do that uh, unless... Uh, unless you try to com communicate a, a global flood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, I think there's a few arguments that he's made. Um, w one of them there is that uh, we cannot take Genesis account literally because of the passages such as uh, Genesis 2.24, which um, mm. he says that a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. The mm -hmm. argument is essentially saying that if this passage is metaphorical and not literal, then the creation account may be metaphorical and not literal. What is the best way to respond to such an argument? Well, see, a lot of that video was it was knocking down a straw man of wooden literalism, and yet creationists for, for years have insisted that we take the grammatical historical approach or what I, I've called the originalist approach. What would it have meant to the original readers? And the thing is, um, the two becoming one flesh is sort of what they do. I mean, that's what a married couple does in a sense. So why do we have to take it, uh, this wooden literalism that he, he wants to Im imp impose on us, which we've never actually taken? In fact, the word literal historically basically meant the grammatical historical approach that allows the figurative language, but the figurative language was explained in the text what they're talking about, a married couple. And in fact, even the Hebrew, you got the, the word echad, one flesh, and the, and the word echad is always this composite unity. The day, the evening and morning is yom echad. Again, the one day is a compo 
a combination of the evening and morning to become one flesh, that the man and woman become one. It's this composite unity has been taught there. I think he is just knocking down this, this straw man uh, badly. Of the type of literalism so he finds, oh, here's something which might be so this. Uh, we've got the liberty to deny everything that Genesis teaches. I mean, so we find Jesus is eye in the door, and therefore we can't trust the resurrection narratives. Right. Yeah. Right. There's no logic behind that. No, zero logic. I, I found the same thing to be true, Dr. Sarfati. Inspiring philosophies arguments, which, as we know, come from people like Heiser, Walton, they are a straw man. You know, they're just knocking down straw man arguments because it's a position we, we don't hold. And I like the way you put it, that they assert we take the Bible as wooden literalism, but we take the Bible, we take it as a, a grammatical historical approach, which allows for the figurative language. So, yeah, the, the, I guess if these are the best arguments that they have, then it seems almost borderline desperate, you know, in my opinion, from what I'm saying. I, th I think it's, it's, it's what you call intellectual dishonesty, because, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to attack evolution without addressing the best arguments they have. And, and yet somehow it's OK to ignore what creations actually have said throughout history and, and um, straw man of hyper literalism. Right. Right. That's a great point. Uh, I've got a lot of questions flying by here. So I thought I'd put this one on the screen before we get to um, the next question that, that came in over the last week. But so this question is, what would be your answer to Hugh Ross, who says Psalm 95 and Hebrews 4 indicate that we still live in this? OK, so I, I've heard that argument before that these. Oh, yes. Guys, I think we're still living in this heaven. I mean, nothing that Hugh Ross has said that I haven't dealt with in refuting compromise, probably, including this one. Um, you see, there's a comparison uh, of the days, but it doesn't mean that the seventh day is still continuing. It means that, the se that, that there will be an eternal rest. Uh, but does it see God could say, I'm you could have, I could start my rest on Monday, on Sunday. Okay, I'm resting for Sunday. Doesn't mean I'm resting all the way till Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh, the seventh day is, is totally completed. See, if someone says he, on Monday, I rested on Saturday and I'm still resting, it doesn't mean that Saturday lasted until Monday. See, if God God's rested on the seventh day, it doesn't mean the seventh day is continuing, only that his rest is continuing. So I think they've totally confused the sort of uh, thing going on because you go to the next chapter when Genesis 2, 3 tells you that the God finished creating on day six and now he's resting. And that's why you've got the seven day week. I mean, we don't have an eternal Sabbath, do we? I mean, we work for six days, rest for one day. We don't rest for one eternal day. OK, it's, a, it's an ordinary day there. Right. It really is, yeah. it's, it's grasping at straws there. Um, by by saying that the seventh day is still continuing, but then it's it's an inspiration for it all for a for a seventh day a Sabbath. It makes no sense. <laughs> it's an article we answered quite a long time ago. And these things, uh, creation.com has answered a very a long time. Ago. This article is over twenty years old. Okay, so we, we we've heard these things. Why are you still bothering right. us with these things? Please address the arguments we have against. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it's it's almost. Cool. Well, you, I, 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 I believe the Soviets um, attempted to change the uh, seven-day week mm -hmm. uh, in order to uh, improve their uh, production efficiency, and they found that not only were the people affected by it, but also their machines. The machines were breaking down more uh, regularly. So um, yeah, that's something to support that argument. But since since we're discussing the flood account, Dr. Sfardi, Mm -hmm. uh, and the evidence uh, for a global flood from Scripture is very strong. Yes. Does the scientific empirical data corroborate the Genesis account? I think in many ways. Uh, I think I may have talked about it a bit last time too. Uh, I've actually uh, got a talk on the flood. And there are several lines of evidence I talk about. One is the incredibly rapidly formed layers. So you've got, got huge dinosaurs buried. You see, uh, how do you get a fossil if you don't bury it quickly? I mean, have you seen fossil roadkill li lately? Okay, you probably haven't, have you? And, and also, do you go scuba diving and see all these fish fossilizing on the ocean floor? 
No, it doesn't work that way. You've got to bury something quite deeply uh, to get a fossil. Okay, so you've got rapidly formed layers, not slow and gradual layers, but to, but catastrophically formed layers. But then the layers are also incredibly um, wide in extent, you see. So the layers are often go right across a continent. They go even correlate with the layers in other continents across the ocean you see so you got a, when you've got a, a common effect you must have a common cause and the cause of this the, these layers being formed rapidly must be something global which is again why the, the flood was global a combination of the rapidity and the huge extent of the layers but a further thing is the the incredibly flat contact lines between them and some of these contact lines have things that wouldn't last very long like for instance if you left a footprint outside it's not going to last for millions of years you'd be lucky if it lasts a day before it's worn away but some of these these rock layers have footprints on them and raindrop marks on them so why didn't they get worn away well the answer is they were buried by the next layer that cemented them in place and uh, also, when you look at, say, the Grand Canyon, you look across the rim, as I've been there briefly once, okay, you see this, it looks like a layer of uh, huge pancakes, very flat contact line, but the surface of the Grand Canyon is incredibly rugged, jagged. Okay, it's been exposed to the elements, it's very eroded. So if every one of these rock layers was exposed for millions of years, why doesn't that surface look rugged and eroded? You see, that's what erosion does to the surface. It makes it irregular. But the, uh, it, clearly there hasn't been any time for erosion or anything else between the layers. Basically, it's, it's one rapidly formed huge wide layer, uh, after one after the other. So it points to very little time between the layers as well. So you've got a combination of rapid formation, huge extent, and no time between the layers. And you're adding up to evidence for a global flood here. Yeah, right. some some of the papers, some of the papers that I've read on uh, erosion rates, uh, they indicate that the entire uh, landscape of Earth's should have eroded to uh, uh, sea level in approximately twelve million years. So mm -hmm. when they talk about sixty, a hundred million, two hundred million year old layers, that uh, at really, um, they're, they're, this is their own, this is their own rates, by the way, their own erosion yeah. rates which contradict those ages. My colleague, Dr. Taz Walker, who is actually a geologist, he wrote an article about this about 20 years ago, just what you're saying, the, it's called Eroding Ages, which I'm going to paste down below, which points out that you have to, that, that this that the erosion rates do point on Earth, because if they'd been old, they wouldn't be here. The continents would, be, would, be, would have already been eroded away. So it's actually quite an interesting argument. Yeah, and, and I wanted to jump in real quick, George. Oh, sure. um, and I apologize, real quick, because I wanted to, and, and since this question was brought up, and, and there's so many good points to say, I wanted to point out in your book, Refuting Compromise, which I recommend everybody read. I mean, it's, it's a thorough dismantling of biblical compromise. But page 260 in mm -hmm. your chapter, The Global Flood in Noah's Ark which I find to be a fascinating chapter. You point, and we touched on this uh, last time too, but I really wanted to point it out again because uh, you kind of lay it all out perfectly on this page where um, the flood account in Genesis, which we were saying speaks of, of universal global flood, is corroborated by the scientific data, which a lot of these uh, global flood models are making accurate testable predictions where you mm -hmm. cover the uh, slabs of, of cold ocean floor that yep. have been discovered, that have not, um, I, I quote you here, had not had sufficient time since to be fully assimilated into the surrounding mantle. Yeah. You know, so these are testable predictions that, that are being confirmed. So I just, I wanted to point that out, especially for the audience sake. Um, that, that actually, could you touch on maybe just really briefly why that is is significant? Okay. Well, the theory of catastrophic plate tectonics, I mean, agrees that there has been continental uh, drift, but more like continental sprint. And most of that was called subduction, where you got one of these um, enormous tectonic plates going beneath the other. You see subduction, meaning going below. Now, if this has had, had taken place over millions of years, I'd expect the bottom part here to have equilibrated to the temperature of the surrounding hot mantle but in fact a measure of temperature it's way way lower you see and yet um, it should have had time to for the heat to distribute evenly 
and make that part the same temperature as the surroundings. But if it had only been there for a few thousand years and was in place really, really quickly, instead of millions of years, you'd expect to find uh, it, it's, cold, it's cold down below as we do find. But, you, but, but this, it totally falsifies the idea that it's been going on for millions of years because it just shouldn't be cold anymore. Dr. Safadi, um, mm -hmm. you, you're, you're obviously referring to the um, plates in the North Americas, but uh, just recently, I think December last year, as in 2020, I read mm -hmm. a paper that um, showed exactly the same uh, type of uh, uh, experiences they found in North America under the um, chi China-India plate. Okay. They actually found, they found the plates were actually cold mm. rather than what we should expect if it's uh, billions of years old. It's an interesting problem for them, isn't it? So it does point to a much yeah. younger age and a much faster process than they, they want to tell you. Yeah, well, yeah. We, 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 we've spoken to Professor David McQueen on a number of occasions, mm -hmm. spe specifically about oil exploration and uh, okay. all these cores that they've done. Mm -hmm. And he, he says that there's a lot of information in those cores that uh, we don't know about. And... Um, He's wondering why they're not being released, and uh, obviously, they're obviously uh, we know what happens to people that question the long age or the deep time mm. uh, narrative. So I guess they're they're afraid of um, you know uh, getting uh, getting that information out to other people. No, I, I can't. I don't know much about this. Sorry, I, I'll, take, I'll I trust you on this, That's but good. I just can't really comment much on this. I don't know uh, what the issue is there. Sorry. Well, I was going to point out, um, you know, the reason why I especially brought up your um, uh, page 260 in your book here on the, mm -hmm. on the cold fobs is because this question kind of brought that to mind where uh, the questioner says, why do old earth creationists and theistic evolutionary apologists only focus on interpretation and not saying anything about the science? So that's what I find fascinating mm -hmm. is not only do they want to butcher the text with bad hermeneutics, they also don't really have any convincing argument to the scientific data that's corroborated by the biblical account as well. Well, most so, of the time, all science says this. Most scientists say this. So we've got to actually make our, our Bible fit the what most scientists say, the scientific consensus or whatever words they use. They don't even bother addressing uh, the arguments we make against the so-called evolutionary science, which we have made in detail. Um and yet the whole the whole motivation for these long age views is to try to fit with the evolutionary science, which they accept without question. That's right. And and here's another good comment on something that here we go. I, on Second Peter three, this is what I find um, funny is that the global judgment by fire in Revelation that comes immediately after the verse that talks about the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. They're trying right. to just throw a local event in there. But if the flood is local, is anybody really going to say that the upcoming judgment by fire is also local? You know, it makes more sense hermeneutically that both events, including the creation event, that the scoffers well, are denying are all yeah, universal events. That's right. If the flood's local, you just escape the, uh, the coming judgment by fire by getting out of Iraq, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, the flood right, was in Mesopotamia, that's what they believe, but which is modern day Iraq. So let's stay out of Iraq and you'll be fine. I don't think that's what it's trying to tell you, though, somehow. And also, I mean, if the flood really was in Mesopotamia, uh, it would actually have flowed off down towards the Indian Ocean and carried the ark with it. It wouldn't carry the ark up to the mountains of Ararat, it would carry it in the opposite direction. So how does the ark get onto the mountains of Ararat if it's just a local flood of Mesopotamia? And nothing makes sense. No, nothing does. Well, um, Dr. Sarfati, I got an interesting question here to, to kind of get it back on track with, uh, especially inspiring philosophy. Mm -hmm. This was like one of his number three or two of supposedly, you know, the top 10 that, that oh, we yeah. can't address. And, and I'm curious as to your thoughts on this argument, because to me, it was just grasping at straws. So he claimed that there was death before the fall, because in Genesis 128, God says to subdue the earth and also mm -hmm. have dominion over all animals. So he's, he points out that in the Hebrew, his argument is that these words are extremely harsh and are used to indicate war conquest 
and enslavement. So he's claiming that God is now telling humans to make a warlike conquest on the earth in order to subdue it and thus co um, contradicting a, a perfect creation with no sin and death. What are your thoughts on that argument? Well, yeah, I wrote about this uh, with Dr. Carl Wieland uh, probably about 20 years ago now, uh, and I addressed this, this whole issue uh, of, of whether the Genesis 128 implies that we should rape the environment or harshly um, uh, destroy things. Well, in fact, the worst environmental damage has been under atheistic communism and not under the uh, Western uh, sort of so-called uh, generally Christian worldview. So I wrote about this uh, while back, and one of the things I pointed out was, in fact, the word uh, radar, uh, it's, it could be benign because you have Solomon, whose benevolent dominion resulted in peace and, peace and safety, each man under his own fig tree. So you got radar, the dominion, was a benign thing, and also even the kabash to, to, to subdue, uh, it can mean just the reigning of something. It can be benevolent or it can be destructive because you have um, Micah 7.19, which talks about subduing sin which is clearly a good thing, okay? So um, these words depend on context. And since this is before the pre-fall world and God himself has, is, is calling the creation very good, uh, these words must be taken in their benevolent, um, in their benevolent uh, state and not in, in, as a harsh uh, judgmental. So he's using the post-fall fall meaning to interpret a pre-fall um, use of the word. He just shouldn't be able to do that. And I mean, Adam was supposed to work the garden. There are plenty of things you can do um, in a pre-fall world that would be uh, following the dominion mandate, even without killing or eating uh, animals and no killing of humans, obviously. So he, ha he has to override the clear meaning of scripture to, to make his case. Uh, Dr. Svadi, I think we've uh, solved that audio problem. Uh, okay, it seems good. To be, Thank uh, you. It seems to be... It seems to be uh, happening when you're typing and talking at the same time so oh, um me then. okay but, sorry yeah yeah sorry, look I um find, uh, the, these articles i can post them for you for your listeners so you know where to uh to go um yeah I, sorry, I've been, I, I, I won't type anymore then i, I won't do it anymore okay Oh no, that's okay, Doctor Sarfati. And, and, and every everything you're saying is, is coming out 99.9 percent .9 of the time. Okay. It's just that once in a while. So even if uh, there's an instance where you want to post an article for me, or mm -hmm. in, in the comment section, um, I guess we'll just know at that point there might be a bit of cutting out. I okay. want to get to this one before we move on, and, and that was a great response. That yeah, one thing, and there's so many good points that you make that you know we could go on so many rabbit trails. One thing I'll say is I caught you saying that you dealt with this 20 years ago. <laughs> and they're still using it in a video, December 2020, like it's something we, we can't address. Well, I mean, I, I dealt with the people the sun over 20 years ago. We got published in the Creation Magazine a bit more recently, but I actually put it, it was on the web a long time ago. And same with this uh, Second Peter 3, 8, so a day is like a thousand years. I actually dealt with it over 20 years ago, but it's been published in the Creation Magazine oh, about 11 years ago, sorry. But the thing is, it's a long time ago when I... I I, I dealt with these things People before me had dealt, as I say, the church fathers, reformers, Thomas Aquinas dealt with a lot of these arguments too. Right. Right. So they've been dealt with. And I guess these biblical compromisers are just hoping that, you know, uh, the listeners don't look into it. So he, he, here's a super chat that, that came mm -hmm. in. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Doki Doki. Is, is there irony when someone says heavens were of old in second Peter three, which means well, yeah, apparently it's going to allow for billions of years. Well, they want to say a day is like a thousand years and say the creation days are a thousand years long, but that doesn't actually get you very far because the issue is thousands versus billions. It doesn't make a, a very much difference at all. Um, it, it's sort of a, a rounding error type difference is what you're talking about there. So it doesn't help their cause. And in fact, the passage isn't talking about creation days. It's actually doing a contrast between a short period and a long period of time to show God that's outside of time. So even though we see a difference between a short period and long period because we're in time for God, it's 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 nothing. So be patient and be faithful and uh, trust that God is going to fulfill his promises uh, in 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 the time of his choosing. In fact, Second Peter 3 goes back to Psalm 90 verses, verse 4, a psalm of Moses, you know, the author of Genesis, the, the editor of Genesis. And he says a thousand years is like a day or like a watch in the night. 
So was he really saying that uh, someone could be unlucky and have a night shift for, for a thousand years? I don't think he's saying the night watch is a thousand years long. He's doing a contrast between a short period uh, versus a long period of time, which implies these are literal time measures, but are being compared to make a deep theological point depending on these literal contrasts between a short and long time period. Right. That's a great point. That's a great point. Thank you. Um, okay. Right here, quite question came in. One of my church leaders told me that death in Genesis 3 is really spiritual death in response to, to his comment that old agers believe in death before sin. Okay, but then when, when Adam sinned, God told him, uh, you are now going to die. You, you, you were made from dust. Now you've got to go back to the dust. How is there anything but physical death there? Okay, it's clearly a physical death. I mean, it doesn't say that he went back to the ape-like creatures that he was evolved from, does it? I mean, if, dust, if Adam being made from a dust means he was made from apes, then returning to the dust means he becomes an ape upon death. Okay, see, all these compromises lead to far more problems than, than they solve. But then you have to go into 1 Corinthians 15, where God compares the death that Adam brought with the resurrection of dead that of jesus which was clearly a physical death and physical resurrection he went he was buried in the tomb he was physically dead then he rose physically uh, on the third day you see uh, if adam's death is only spiritual does that mean jesus's resurrection is only spiritual as well no the whole point uh, is Paul point. Was teaching a bodily resurrection this is foundational for our faith and this is not a side issue uh when you have um aberrations about adam the first man what are you going to do about the last Adam? It's going to affect what you believe about the last Adam. You see, Paul, right, that's Paul falls them, but he compares, uh, I think, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, uh, Jesus is called the last Adam in contrast with Adam, the first man who brought sin and death into the human race. So Jesus comes to die. You know, he lives a perfect human life as a human life, so he could actually... Uh, our his righteousness, a human righteousness, could be imputed to us. So God regards us as forgiven of our sins, and then our sins are imputed upon Him in the cross and taken away from us. And then He dies on the cross because death is the punishment for sin. So if 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 death is not the punishment for sin, how could Jesus' death pay for our sin? Okay, it's a problem. Amen, amen. And like you said, that's not peripheral. To our Christian faith, that's essential. That's the gospel. That that's salvation right there. So that, that that's a great point. Right there. In First Corinthians fifteen, he quotes uh, from Genesis two and Genesis three, and he makes clear allusions to Genesis one. And this is in his 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 uh, gospel resurrection chapter, and in, in his in his letter to the Corinthians, and he goes to Genesis one, two, and three. And what's more, he expects his readers to know what he's talking about. He doesn't have to explain who Adam was. He thought his readers were already taught in that. Right. He, he presupposed explained. that. Yeah. And he also goes into the things that God created during creation week. And again, he, he presupposes his readers were well aware of the events of creation week over, over six days. He didn't explain it. He assumed they'd been taught that. Right. Right. Yeah, that's that, that's a great answer right there. And and here's something uh, branching off of what you said earlier about the, the, the local flood argument being a joke, because it, it brings me to something that I, I remember reading in your book, too. Um, this commenter says you would not even need an arc for a local flood. You would just need to change locations and avoid the local flood, because I, I believe you dealt with an argument in your book from Hugh Ross, who said, and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, he said that the ark was just used for a platform to preach. Is that accurate? Well, it's a, I think it's a bit, bit of overkill to make an arc as, as longer than a football field and, and wider right. than six lanes of the interstate and taller than a four-story building just to have a platform to preach on. Well, the Bible tells you why the ark was used. It was used to house all the animals. It wasn't used as a platform. The Bible tells you its purpose is to keep the uh, animals and, and humans alive throughout the year of the flood. That's what it was used for. I mean, Ross is just imagining things as he usually does, unfortunately, because he wants to keep his millions of years. So he has to play very um, loose uh, with what the Bible tells you. Okay, right. so it, it doesn't make much sense. It's, it's such overkill. I mean, 
Uh, and also God, God even told you, well, you, you're going to have to have enough space for your, you, your wife, your, your three sons and their wives, and, and two of every kind of land animal. Uh, and we see it's seven, seven pairs of every, every clean animal. He's told us what the ark is for. And the other thing with a local flood, but what about the rainbow promise? What did God actually promise not to do ever again was just what he's done, right? So what did he do? A local flood back then? So there'd be no local floods ever since then. Doesn't that mean God has broken his promise? Yes. If he promised never to yes. do this in the local horribly devastating local floods have killed um, thousands of people. Uh, but God doesn't break promises. So what God promised not to do was to send another global flood. And he has kept that promise. So the rainbow is a good reminder. In fact, it's a reminder from, to God, from God to himself that he's never going to do this again. Do what? Do another global flood again. That's quite clear. Yeah, to me, that's the knockout argument. You know, for years I've thought of that. If, if his promise is to never again bring a flood, well, if they're holding to a local flood position, there's been, as you said, many local floods that have been devastating and have resulted in, in the death of many. So that would be the the, the breaking of, of God's promise. So, yeah, that's, that's a great point. And, and George, I think you're going to say something, brother. Yeah, yeah, I was uh, just while we're on the um, the Genesis subject, uh, mm -hmm. there are arguments um, made by um, biblical compromisers such as inspiring philosophy and John Walton that Genesis 2 is actually a sequel to Genesis 1. After God establishes the cosmos, he narrows in on one region of the, the earth to create a garden environment, and therefore the creation of Adam and Adam in Genesis 2 is not really the uh, first man, but uh, Michael Heiser has stated that Genesis 1 encompasses all of humans, while Genesis 2 picks up uh, after this with the creation of um, or the election of two specific individuals to act as priests, if you like, in the Garden of Eden. And so the implication is that Adam came after when mm. all of humanity was made in the image of God. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Okay, again, this is again not what the Bible tells you. Like when Jesus gave his reasons for marriage, he goes to Genesis 1 27 and 2 24. So God in the beginning, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, the two will become one flesh. He's linking uh, Genesis 1 27 with 2 24, showing he's talking about the same humans in both cases. So this is what yeah. Jesus believed. That this is actually um, one creation account referring to both. Um, so both of them referred to Adam and Eve there from the beginning. A single man and a single woman. That's what Jesus said. He didn't have any problem thinking that these were the same people involved. And there is some truth about recapitulation and what these guys said. So they just got it all wrong, but they were how they apply it. I mean, in the ancient Near Eastern literature, often they would have a detail, a sort of overall a summary account, and then they'd focus in on one particular aspect of that. Okay, so what Genesis 1 is the, the account of the creation of the whole cosmos, including the creation of male and female to have dominion over the earth. And then Genesis 2 gives you more information about that man and woman that was briefly mentioned in Genesis 1. And it provides far more detail about what happened on that day 6. So day 6 tells you... Uh, God made the male and female, doesn't tell you how many. It tells you them to multiply. It tells them to have dominion. But in Genesis 2, gives you more detail about that, that, that event by saying that God created Adam from the, the dust. Uh, he had Adam count all the animal, uh, to name all the animals. Because that connects as well. Because Genesis 1, uh, God gives him dominion over creation. Uh, Genesis 2 shows an exercise of the dominion because naming in the Bible is an exercise of dominion. So Genesis 1 says have dominion. Genesis 2 shows Adam exercising dominion over the animals. And then God makes Eve from Adam's rib. Okay, so you've got far more detail about the first human couple in Genesis 2 as opposed to a brief mention of Genesis 1. So it's not at all like what uh, Heiser and, and Walton say. They're clearly the same people involved in both accounts. Believe, believe it or not, people still ask us, how, how could Adam name all the animals in, uh, in the one day? 
It's ridiculous. It's what, but the thing is, what animals are you talking about? It's not talking about plants. It's not talking about marine creatures. It's not talking about the insects. It's talking about the land vertebrate animals. That's the nefesh haya, um, the animals with the backbone. So no congressman involved, right? So... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so and also, I mean, the kind of the dog kind of wasn't a chihuahua and a duck and, and a great dane and, and all these things. There's one in the kind that incorporated the jackal, the, the wolf, the jackal, uh, the domestic jaw, dogs are all descended from that created kind. Uh, one cat kind from which the uh, domestic cat, the, the leopard, the lion, the tiger, they're all descended from that cat kind. So probably not that many kinds were involved. So in fact, we were getting something about I've got an article about 25 years ago where we answered that question about naming all the animals. You see, again, this shows that these I'm not really thinking of anything new that we haven't already seen. I mean, I talk about that in my, my book as well, because one of Ross's arguments for a long day was there's too much to do for day six. And I actually showed, well, no, there's not. <laughs> I, I I immediately realized that going through your uh, through your book, Refuting Compromise, um, where you really dealt with these arguments in great detail. And I've personally never seen any any good convincing responses because even Ross seems to use that whole straw man argument on biblical kinds, because as you pointed out. Adam's not sitting there naming every single domestic dog or every single bear species, like the polar bear, for example, which would, would have ultimately descended from an original bear kind, for example, because even Ross, I believe, I can't remember where it was in your book, but he tried to say that us having to bring polar bears onto the ark oh, has been a problem. But then you pointed out that polar bears would be descended from the ark kind. They wouldn't have exactly. necessarily been on the ark. And they, they, they must have split fairly recently because even now the polar bear and the grizzly bear can interbreed. They, they have a, the, their offspring's called a, grizz, a growler bear or a pizzly. So quite clearly they're part of the same kind uh, because they can interbreed together. Right. And, and see, Ross teaches a, a discredited view called fixity of species. Now, there are a lot of people who want to accuse us of believing in fixity of species, but Ross really believes that. But see, Darwin, uh, see, creationists, even before Darwin, understood the kind was broader than what they call a species. They understood there must be variation within a kind to explain how many varieties we have now compared to fewer animals on the ark, uh, comparatively to few animals on the ark. You see, they understood before Darwin that one kind could give rise to many varieties. They did this with breeding experiments. They, they knew all these sort of things, but Hugh Ross believes in the fixity of species. Which was Darwin's straw man to attack. He attacked uh, Charles Lyell because the, I mean, he didn't attack him personally, but he actually addressed Charles Lyell's fixity of species arguments. And see, Ross is repeating Charles Lyell's fixity of species arguments instead of uh, the biblical kind uh, argument. And here's an article that where I came one after I wrote my first book, but you find William Lane Craig still praising Ross's argument against the flood and the ark, uh, which I'd actually answered in my in refuting compromise. Yeah, so nothing really new, as uh, um, Ecclesiastes says, right? So nothing That's new right. under the sun. Hmm. Nothing new under the sun, and and you've thoroughly dismantled these. For example, um, I think that's why the old Earth creation model from you know. Fuzz Rana and Hugh Ross, they don't really have anything in regards to um, kinds or speciation because of what you're saying with, with their position on the fixity of species, which doesn't make any sense because with ever-changing environments, we would also need ever-changing genomes that can adapt to those environments. So I, I've never thought yeah. about the fix, right? Well, and also and, the thing is, when you look at modern uh, modern uh, biology, they understand that the best way to get something uh, a variety established quickly is to have a small and isolated population of something, uh, as opposed to a large population when they can interbreed and sort of average out a reversion to the mean. So, if you want to get a, a, a variety, you have to uh, isolate it, which is how you breed dogs. You've got to isolate them to stop them interbreeding with the main parent population. Okay, that's how you get varieties of dogs that we see because you're breeding and isolating small populations. Now, the flood and the ark would have provided the conditions for isolating small populations. You have a, a mountainous barrier. Mountains are well known to produce varieties because of the natural isolation of the mountainous barrier. So uh, animals coming off the flood would quickly um, 
diverge into different varieties. Uh, and the arc, the mountain was an ideal place for rapid diversification. Amen. I remember in, in your book, um, you pointed out, I think it was a quote by Fuzz Rana, mm -hmm. where he was misrepresenting the young earth creation model by, nothing there. Yeah, nothing new there, by proposing, I think he was almost proposing that, that we're saying due to some of these speciation events, we're proposing that new information is being added, but you, but you pointed out in the book, no, most of this is due to a loss of information, it you is, know, a, yeah. a loss, right? And that's so the thing, like the polar bear. How do you get whiteness? You see, uh, is your removal of pigment. See, whiteness is a lack of any any melanin in the fur or the skin. That's how you get white fur. Like it's a lack of melanin. And also, how do you get webbed feet? You see, when you think about how your um, your fingers and toes develop in the embryo, it starts off with something a plate developing at the end of your arm or your leg, and then tissue. Uh, this programmed cell death called apoptosis that 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 uh, puts a um, a gap between the digits. That's how our fingers develop. It's very different from the way frogs develop, by the way. So it's an argument from an anti-evolution argument here. See, frogs, their digits develop outwards, while ours they form like this, and then stuff comes out between them. So it's a totally different way of developing digits from humans and frogs. The thing is, if this process is somehow uh, mutated, the the, the, the separation is not complete, so you have webbing in between instead of total separation. So you can understand how a loss of information can convert sort of separated digits like this to a web digit, you see. So it gains a loss of information to produce some of these things. That would be good for a polar bear. A polar bear right. wants to be white. It wants to be camouflaged against the snow so that the prey can't see it coming. It wants to have the web feet so it can swim better, you see. So these defects would be an advantage to the polar bear. Right, that's right. There's some great points, and and that entire section where where you discuss those examples in your book, refuting compromise, was was fascinating. So many great points that probably just went over the head of, of a lot of the old Earth Earthers. A um, couple questions here, mm -hmm. Cecil Dre. So he he's mentions um, Kenneth Miller, okay. and I think he's written a book too on compromising the Bible with evolution. Are, are you familiar with, with um, Miller and, and how he responds to, I'm, I'm sure there's probably been a lack of response from him as well in oh, regards to, you know, yeah. He's, uh, I think a very liberal Roman Catholic. It's really quite, quite, uh, and I jointly wrote a review of Miller's book again about 20 years ago with John Booker. He's a very astute um, man, expert in zoology and uh, and geology. Uh, now, I, I reviewed Miller's book and showed where he's quite wrong about what creationists believe. And in fact, he goes even against um, traditional Catholic, Catholic teachings, even. So uh, it's just, uh, it's, it becomes even more bizarre what he has to do. But he, of course, is an ardent evolutionist, believes in the, the whole good to you via the, the zoo picture of evolution. Okay, so I'm going to link there where I actually re reviewed his book quite some time ago. But he's definitely uh, a theistic evolutionist of some sort, but actually very much more evolution than theism in his thing. And that's often the case um, when they go down the evolutionary uh, track, it becomes less and less theistic and more and more evolutionary. Right, right. Yeah, I, I mean, if he's holding to um, Roman Catholicism type doctrine, then I guess it's not a, a surprise sometimes when you go down the but it's, 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 evolution it's, route too. But see, the traditional Catholic belief has been six-day creation. Thomas Aquinas is a six-day creationist, okay? Uh, Basil the Great, all the people that the Catholic Church regards as the doctors of the church, I mean, the, a subset of the saints in Catholic teaching as the doctors. You look at the doctors of the church, they were six-day creationists, most of them. Right. If you go to right. church That's history, uh, which they want to do a tradition uh, instead of scripture, you go to tradition and, and all their, their great leaders, they, they taught six-day creation. They didn't teach evolution. It's it's funny how well, I was just gonna. It's funny how all their great leaders, you know, all, all the church fathers and and um, the doctrines and positions that have been passed down for thousands of years, none of them saw in scripture what you know what they're claiming. So it, it's not that that there to see. That's why I mean, that, that right. means I'm not saying that these guys are equal. I mean, the scriptures are final authority. I accept that. I say that in refuting compromises. But we go to these. Um, 
church fathers and reformers to see how other Christians understood it. We're not the first people in the world to open a Bible. It's a bit of humility to realize that other people before us have also opened the Bible. They also knew Greek and also knew Hebrew, and yet none of them saw uh, long ages uh, or evolution in the Bible because nothing to see there. How come people only saw that in the 19th century when that became the rage uh, in the so-called science, the long age geology, the evolutionary biology? That's when people started seeing these um, compromised positions. How come no one ever saw them before? Amen. Amen. I, I completely agree. And, and that kind of brings me to this important question, because this is the one we hear all the time. Sure. Um, it is the word, and we've kind of touched on this, but I think it's just so important that we can elaborate on it more. Is the word yom a 24 hour period of time in regards to the word day or a long period of time that it seems like people um, such as Hugh Ross would, would purport? Well, except that John Bolton uh, is very clear that the days can't be long periods of time. I mean, it is interesting that these people can't agree on much else. They only agree we can't take the Bible as, at face value, but they disagree about everything else. So there are many more ways to be wrong than to be right. That's the thing. Right. Good and point. they're all wrong in mutually incompatible ways. Uh, but see, day with an evening and morning and number is, is going to be an ordinary day. And you've got several things to compare. You see, in Numbers chapter 7, you've got a, a, a 12 numbered days where each the leader of each of the 12 tribes of Israel comes to bring a dedication to the altar, okay, over 12 days. The first one, someone from Judah comes. And then you've got uh, the different tribes all coming along one day after another. Okay, no one has any problem understanding what the days mean. We didn't think that the altars dedicated over billions of years. We know it's the numbered days are ordinary days. And yet I think Genesis 1 is easier to understand because it has not just the numbers, but it says there's an evening and morning. You see, a million-year period doesn't have evening and morning. It's got lots of them. But an evening, there's evening, there's morning, numbered day. I mean, that's it's, it's overkill almost to make it clear it's an ordinary day we're talking about here. And then, of course, you've got the Ten Commandments, as I mentioned before, where God told us that he meant uh, ordinary day because it's a pattern for our working week. So, um in the context of Genesis 1, it's got these contextual markers like the number, the evening and morning, which make it very clear. It, sort of, it constrains the possible meaning of day to a 24-hour period or a part thereof, not millions of years. It, it makes me – oh, I'm sorry, George. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to add, uh, Dr. Sfati, uh, we have regular debates and discussions in forums such as this. Mm -hmm. With uh, uh, what they, they call themselves evolutionists slash atheists. Oh yes, and they they and they claim to have been Christians at one stage, mm -hmm. but having read the Bible, they were convinced uh, that it wasn't true. But uh, I always say to them, you know, um, especially the theistic evolutionists mm -hmm. uh, who believe that God uh, put in a process. Um, of gradual improvement in, into the um, into the gene pool to get to um, modern man, but uh, that that process involves um, disease, mm -hmm. mutation, deformities, death, and I say to them, how can God then turn around and call that very good? That's a God that I don't want to believe in, and um, I, I just find it surprising that they they can say they were Christians at one stage and now. Now they're not because of evolution. Well, I mean, I think because the theistic evolution is saying, well, God used evolution, but I mean, the atheists understand, well, hang on, do you understand what evolution is about? It means uh, it's a, a, a wasteful, cruel, ineff uh, inefficient process. And you want to tell me this loving God uh, used this terribly uh, cruel, inefficient process to make everything? I mean, under evolution, the meat do not inherit the earth. You want to tell me that Jesus, the creator, used evolution? to contradict what he says in the gospel, where he says the meek shall inherit the earth. But evolution says um, the meek get crushed by the strong. That's what um, evolution's about. And they say, well, what, I, I don't know why you want to believe in a creator who did all these horrible things. It's a very cruel process. I mean, it's, it's not so much survival of the fittest they talk about. It's usually death of the unfittest they talk about. Yeah, that, that's so you, you that evolution, that, that evolution requires lots and lots of death over lots and lots of years. There's that's nothing really good up. about that. Sorry? Yeah, it follows up to my next question. Uh, did the second law begin at the fall? 
Uh, no, definitely not. And the reason I say that, because people seem to misunderstand that uh, the arguments in thermodynamics, it talks about entropy. Now, entropy is loosely related to, to disorder, but it's, it's not really quite like that. It's a bit more subtle than that. You see, so there's some things that we regard as good that are still uphill in entropy. Like um, when you eat food and digest it, you see, you're breaking down the molecules of the food that your body's gonna build it up again. So digestion is definitely increasing disorder, but we don't seem to mind that too much. You know, the sun shining light and heat onto the earth. That's a classical example of entropy going up. But we know the sun lit and heated the earth before the fall. So entropy was definitely um, operating there. Um, you can bake a cake. How do you bake a cake? You, you you break the egg and you mix the flour, you mix the salt, the sugar, whatever you have there, the yeast, okay? And so what do you do there? You mix it up. Now, try and get the eggs, flour, sugar, and salt back again. You can't do yeah, it, well, right? Well, and you bake yeah, a cake. Well, what do you do when you bake it? You're, you're actually disordering the protein molecule, denaturing proteins. So the egg protein denatures, binds the whole thing. And the yeast or the baking powder... Um, decomposes, releases gas into the into the cake and makes it all fluffy, you see. These are all entropy-increasing processes that we regard as good. Yet yeah, we know believe that, it or not, mm, believe well, it or not, we still get uh, people who are um, mechanical engineers and claim to know the um, second law, uh, use the example of um, uh, snowflakes and uh, oh, yeah. ice and salt crystals as, as some argument against entropy. Okay, that's a different topic. So I addressed that in my book by design. It's actually coming out on a new edition soon. Okay, but my, my book, the by design, I talk about crystals and how they are irrelevant to uh, the argument from design, uh, because see, a crystal is actually a low. Uh, energy structure. It's a very ordered structure. There's, there's, there's not much information in crystal. It's a repetitive structure. You see, you've got to, a, a unit cell, you repeat it, you see. And the six-fold structure is you've got randomness, but you're repeating it six-fold because of the way the water molecules um, bond and go to their lowest energy state. There's not much information in a crystal or a salt crystal. In fact, you can, if you break up a salt crystal, you just get more tinier salt crystals. You don't, don't change anything really, just getting more smaller version of the same thing. But if you break up a protein or DNA, you're destroying the whole thing. And, okay, so and, and uh, it doesn't work. It, it's, it's a case, that, like in my first book, Refuting Evolution, that's about 20 something years old now. Um, I talk about the difference between the order of a crystal is more like say A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, repeating the same thing. But the order of a protein is more like the works of Shakespeare. It's not repetitive, but it's also not random. So we, what life has to have, it can't be uh, ordered and low information like a crystal, but it also can't be random. It must be a specified, um, but not a regular pattern, though. That's the thing about living things. Like this refuting evolution, chapter nine, I talk about that. Yeah, I, f I find it surprising that they use the ice example because clearly in the formation of ice, we, you have uh, the removal of heat, which, which, is a, which is an entropy, which is an increase in entropy. Well, you see, what happens, the ice crystallizes and releases heat into, uh, into the surrounding, so it means the overall entropy of the, the universe is going up in that process because the, the increase yeah. of entropy in the surroundings balances the loss of entropy in the ice crystal. Okay, so the idea is that the overall entropy incre uh, is going to in, uh, increase no matter what you do. So the body growing, we're going to increase entropy in the process. I mean, everything we do increases entropy. But I'll go post a link of an, an old article of mine where I talk about the crystals and also the view um, of entropy of, of the second law and the fall. So I, I talk about um, both of those in this ancient article that I've pasted below there. Well, those yeah, are some great answers. Uh, uh, go ahead, sorry, Jordan. Go, you have a question. I, I was just going to finish off uh, in in our engineering course, and mm -hmm. I'm going back quite a few years now, probably over probably forty years or so. Oh wow! Uh, <laughs> yeah, we were introduced to uh, thermodynamics, and one of the things they, they they taught us, and it stuck into my head: the total entropy is always yes. increasing. It's yes. the total entropy. 
And yeah. you look at from a universe point of view, the total entropy is always increasing. So exactly. That's yes. Yeah, go ahead, uh, standing. Yeah, no, great points. I just um, before I forget a, a point that Dr. Sarfati, you were making on the word yom in regards mm -hmm. to day. I was curious mm -hmm. as to your thoughts because th this is a counter argument I hear frequently, and I heard it just recently. Mm -hmm. I believe it was between Hugh Ross and Jason Lyle in, in their latest debate where the word day, Hugh Ross pointed to the word day used in Genesis 2-4. Oh, yes. Trying to argue that it can mean long periods of time in order to support his position. I was curious as to your thoughts on that. Oh, I answered that in, in the book as well. Okay, but that's that's refuting compromise again. These are these are old arguments. You see, Genesis two four is not just yom; it's bayom. It's called a bound grammatical construction. You got the see, day is yom, be is in, so bayom in the day. But it's it's also an idiom to mean when. Okay, so it, it's you can't take the bound grammatical construction of Genesis two four and apply it to the unbound construction construction in Genesis 1. But also you go back to that, that chapter, Numbers chapter 7 I talked about with the, the 12 days, uh, tribes off, giving their offering over 12 days. At the end of that, you have the same sort of construction in the day the altar was dedicated, referring to the, the 12 days previously. So it doesn't. So if you use an argument against literal days of Genesis 1, you have to use it for the literal days of the dedication of the altar and say maybe the altar was dedicated over 12 billion years or whatever he wants to say. There's the same construction in both cases. So it really is a weak argument. It's a totally different uh, construction from one, well, one part of the Bible and then wrench it to another part where that, that construction is not there. Yeah, that's a great response. It makes me... <laughs> It makes me wonder how thoroughly they're looking into these arguments because the one argument that comes to mind from your book on page 252, if, if I'm not mistaken, where Ross at some point claimed that six times the word high in the uh, flood account, when it talks about the, the water covering all the high mm -hmm. mountains, he said that in the Hebrew, that word's not even there. Oh, I really took a minute that it is there. Of course it is. I mean, uh, I, I had to take him apart. I'm, is he still saying that sort of thing? Because, I mean, that seems to be old news. That, that he really was pretty much a thunder on that. I mean, he doesn't know Hebrew. That's a I'm not saying I'm a Hebrew scholar by any means. But, um, uh, I, at least in the people who really are Hebrew scholars. But that's such a ridiculous argument. Anyway, let me yeah. press that by, by Hebrew scholar. You know, I interviewed him a few years ago, and we also had a discussion on Genesis 2-4, because he, he's a Hebrew scholar. He's looked into this in quite a lot of detail. So I'm pacing a link about the Genesis 2-4 thing, I hope your, your readers. And I'm going to try to find that thing where I dealt with uh, Hugh Ross, uh, the word high not being in the original. It's just such – he really got egg on his face over that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. A a egg on their faces a lot of times. That's what made me think that a lot of the times their arguments that they're using, they have to almost retract those because clearly they didn't, you know, look too thoroughly into into those arguments before making them. And this question is kind of related to something you said earlier, but I think if I don't ask it now and put it on screen, I'm going to lose it within all the questions that are coming in. Um, if you wanted to give some brief thoughts on it, Dr. Sarfati, I guess the question it has to do with what do you think about flood boundaries in terms of the Ice Age? Did it occur after the flood? And do you agree with McLean and I'm guessing Dr. Marcus Ross yeah, on their interpretation of the boundary? Um, I don't think so. I mean, uh, uh, they're, they're fellow travelers to me. They're not my enemies. They're, they're, our, they're, our, our, they're, they're fellow young Earth creationists. I think that's one of the debates within young earth creationist geology is where the flood boundary is, where it started and where it ended. And I think most of my colleagues would actually tend to put the boundary a bit higher than they do. Uh, I think we all agree the uh, the ice age came after the flood and was caused by the flood. I think that's actually fairly well agreed among us, but the case is where that begins and where it ends. Um, see, I, I'm tending more in line with uh, people like um, uh, Tim Clary or uh, Taz Walker, 
um, Mike Ord, who had the boundary much higher because of the the rocks were seen to have formed by catastrophic processes. You see, so if you say that these were formed by ordinary uniformitarian processes, then you lose one of the biggest arguments you have for a global flood. So I really. I'd rather go by the physical geology than by the paleontology like those guys. So they're, they're both paleontologists. They favor the, the paleontology uh, information as they see it. Um, I'm more of a physicist myself, and I tend to go by what the uh, the physical geology more. Uh, I, I must admit, I, I'm not a specialist geologist, so I actually have, defer to people like Taz Walker, Mike Ward, uh, Tim Cleary when it comes to geology thing. But I think uh, in our circles, the boundary of the flood is a lot higher than the KT boundary that, that they have it. I, I agree with um, what you said too. That That's typically the position that I hold to as well. Mm -hmm. uh, here's, here's a question here. Um, question for Dr. Sarfati. And I, and I know you talk about this as well. I was just reading it today on the magnetic field in refuting compromise yeah. in one of your last chapters. What are your thoughts yeah. on, on that argument for young earth creation? I feel a very sound one, and I've actually wrote, Russ Humphreys has, um, it, I've actually, uh, um, I wrote about that uh, in 1998 and then updated it in 2014 to try to sort of uh, deal with some of the counter arguments uh, to this. I, I think it's still a very powerful argument. The, measurable. Okay, you can measure how the magnetic field is decaying over time, but also that's what uh, we'd expect from the physics because when you um, do something to an electric current, the decay is always an exponential curve. That's, that's real physics. You don't find linear decays in nature. It's always an exponential dec decay curve you find. So when you uh, look at what we measure from the magnetic field and apply the physics, it looks like a decaying uh, overall decaying field, but during the flood there were some oscillations in the pole, still losing overall energy. But uh, the, the the flood seemed to um, the poles uh, oscillated quite quickly during the year of the flood. And in fact, there's good evidence that there's rapid oscillation, not oscillation over thousands of years, but a very rapid one because what they've found is a lava flow. And, and because the lava flow was thin, they could realize that the cooling, the solidification rate would have been quite quick. And you, you see, when the lava becomes solid, it preserves the magnetic field as at that time. So they could track the 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 the, the, the solidification of this lava flow as, as through the depth and found the magnetic field changing in that short time that the lava flow um, uh, cooled down and, and then became a solid. And that's also in that article I just uh, I put it up above there. So the even the, the rapid reversal of the pole is part of the modern creation argument about the magnetic field decaying as a young earth argument. Since, since we've uh, digressed a little bit, um, and I've had these discussions with many people about the uh, recession of the moon, I'm curious mm -hmm. as to your thoughts of... Uh, Hugh Ross's claim that the creationists are assuming that the spiraling away of the moon from the earth is linear as a way to explain away the moon is getting farther and farther from us limiting the age of the solar system. Uh, I mean, has he, again, how would he get that impression if he actually read what we said about this? Uh, we don't say the moon is linear. We say it's a very strong um, power relation, sixth power decay curve. So it means when the moon was closer, the effect of, of losing energy was actually much stronger uh, when the moon was closer to Earth. So it's really quite uh, wrong from the thing that we assume it linear decay. We do not. We assume, uh, we say what we assume. We say it's actually a sixth power dependency. And when you do that, uh, the moon uh, could not have been um, the, the moon recession about 1.4 billion years. It's, it's, it's way less than the four and a half billion years that evolutionists say for the Earth uh, Sun, uh, the, the Earth Moon system. So here's I wrote here's an article I wrote in 1998 about this, and you see very clearly uh, that uh, I'm not assuming linear decay at all. Doctor Safari, there, there are there are so many problems with that impact theory. It's um, it's unbelievable that these people can believe it because. Uh, I read uh, a, a number of reports recently about uh, the volatiles on uh, the moon and and if, even the secular scientists have agreed that um, in an impact situation, 
that that would have been vaporized completely. You shouldn't find any volatile elements on the moon at all. But but we do. Mm. We find carbon. We find water. Yeah. And uh, and recently, I, I uh, read that uh, they found uh, rust actually on on the moon as well. And uh, how do you get rust without me. liquid water and oxygen? Exactly. So um, even though the giant impact origin was the main theory for a long time, it does seem like uh, they realise there are problems with it now. Oh yeah. Well, they've got nothing better to replace it with, so they have to stick with it, I guess, and and uh, rely on rescue devices to prop it up. I mean, yeah, I'll post an article for you uh, about that. The, the, the giant impact of, uh, of the moon. It's a fairly recent sort of article about it showing that there are problems. I think my book, um, yeah, the, the Genesis account, my commentary on Genesis talks a bit about some of the problems for the moon uh, from modern science. I mean, I wrote the book in 2015, so it's fairly up to date about that. And I, I talk about the evolutionary ideas of the origin of the moon and why none of them work, including the impact one. That's in, in the Genesis account. Well, one one question I have for on, on page three thirty one of uh, refuting compromise mm -hmm. on the decaying magnetic field, yep. you point out their rescue device, the self sustaining dynamo. Right. Not very convincing, in your opinion, based on the evidence, eh, Doctor Sarfati? Well, I mean, for one thing, you've got uh, to the surprise of evolution, this very strong uh, magnetic field of mercury. So mercury uh, would have uh, had a, the, the, it wouldn't be liquid anymore. The, the, it should have hardened by now. The heat should have gone and it should no longer be molten. But the dynamo theory requires a molten uh, core to work. And so how could you have a dynamo theory for mercury when there's no molten core there? And also, uh, Dr. Humphrey's uh, theories about the Earth's magnetic field, which is in that article I posted a bit a while back, uh, he made correct predictions of the magnetic field of Uranus. And sure enough, I mean, even though they're very different from the evolutionary predictions, when Voyager went past Uranus, it found that it matched what Dr. Humphreys has said based on its creation model and totally different to the predictions of a dynamo model. Dynamo model. Yeah. I've got a question on the magnetic magnetic field. Um, yeah. Oh, the, the specifically the dynamo. And correct me if I'm wrong here, but uh, I recall reading a comment or an article. I can't be sure now, but uh, doesn't molten iron lose its magnetic capabilities at a specific temperature? No, I think you're talking about the Curie point there, where, where it no longer becomes. Yeah, that's it. Zero, Curie point, yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it doesn't become. Uh, it's no longer ferromagnetic above that temperature. But what the evolutionists they believe in a dynamo theory, so it's not generated by ferromagnetism, but, but by the uh, circulating electrical currents um, in the core is what they believe. So that so that's how they get around the Curie point issue. It's just so the Curie point issue means there can't be a block of iron there uh, with a, a big magnetic field there. No, there has to be totally electromagnetism that's generating it. So it rules out the uh, theory that, the, that somehow iron got charged and that's why we're talking about magnet there. It, it's a it's an uh, electrically generating theory field, uh, but it's, it's decaying exponentially as we'd expect from uh, things. I mean, have you ever seen things like, I mean, let me show you, for instance, um, let's see if you can see it. Uh, um, so you, can put it up so you can see it. You know, can you see the blue light here? Yes. So, oh, yeah. Okay. Take disconnected the electric currents off. What's happened to the light? It's still there. Right. It's decaying exponentially, but it's still there. Right? There's no electrical power in it anymore, but it's decaying quite slowly. And if you think about when you do the measurements for the Earth, you'd expect the sort of uh, the, this decay curve that we actually observe. And what happened, it's a giant um, electromagnet that's decaying. It's lost its sort of God set up the source of power, and then it was cut off. And what we're seeing is the decay, like you're seeing in this thing I'm illustrating. I mean, the light's getting a bit fainter now. It's taking its time, but now it seems to be off, right? You see, it wasn't immediate. I didn't take, it didn't go off immediately because you've got the, what's called an, uh, a reductor, uh, a resistor inductor circuit here. That's what we have on a giant scale with the Earth. That's why we can think about decaying electrical field, as I've just illustrated for you here. Right. Well, that's just a great point. See? Right. Well, that seems to be yet another fatal blow to an old Earth and obviously the old Earth position from, from Scripture. Mm -hmm. 
because even yeah, their best okay. rescue devices. And, and that's what I love about your book here, Refuting Compromise, Dr. Sarfati, is you go over a number of these lines of evidence, such as um, helium and zircon crystals is one of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, right here, page 337, helium and rocks. And mm -hmm. uh, Hugh Ross's rescue device on that one, it, 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 to you, is it convincing? Is it yet another rescue device, like with the magnetic field? Uh, remind me what it is. So I can look. I think, well, I guess he claims that because the, the, the helium is so slippery mm -hmm. that it can't be depended upon anyways. But well, it seems on, like you just, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I say, but that, that's the whole point. It's so slippery. It should have, it should have um, got out of the rock. The problem with the, with the, uh, for the old earth belief is that we got this, um, this a huge amount of radioactive decay, but the helium is still in the rock. But, but it's, it's so slippery uh, if it had been millions of years old, the helium should have diffused out. I mean, think of your 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 the the helium balloons you buy for your kid's birthday present, so a birthday party. It doesn't last very long before the uh, it flops down because the helium is diffusing through the rubber of the balloon. And that's what I think with, with this, the zircon crystals. Because helium is so slippery, it should have gone out. We shouldn't find any anymore. It should have all disappeared. Right. And yet it's still in the zircon crystal, which means it hasn't been around long enough uh, for the helium to diffuse out. I've heard one argument where they, they claim that um, the helium is diffusing from one uh, crystal and entering into another one. And well, so the, the on and so forth. It goes from uh, a small thing to a large thing. It's not going to start, the, the helium is not going to be in this large thing and then come condensing into this tiny little zircon. It doesn't do that. It's trying to get as far away as possible. So it's going to be pushing, going outwards. That's what diffusion uh, of a gas is. It's going to escape that tiny zircon crystal and move throughout the rock. Never the other way around. It's not going to do that. That doesn't make any sense of, of the physics. Yeah, Dr. Safari, we're, we're constantly bombarded by um, evolutionists about providing a definition to a biblical kind. And mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a bit unfair of us, uh, sorry, from them to be asking us that because mm -hmm. pheromonology is a young science. Mm -hmm. And after all, they, they have, what, 30-odd 30, 30 def definitions of species? I think so, they're not consistent, are they? I mean, uh, I can. They've got a they've got a rigorous definition, which is the biological species, which says that things are part of the same species if they can interbreed and produce fertile offspring uh, within themselves, but not with another different species. That's a rigorous definition. But there's so many others that are not like as rigorous as that because we we even find things with different species, so-called species that can interbreed fine. I mean, the, the cat family is full of that. In fact, even things with different genera, the high, next highest level, they can interbreed. In fact, I wrote an article recently about a sturdle fish, which is a sturgeon and a paddle fish, which are even different families. Right. In the same order, but it's surprised everyone by having offspring between them. They shouldn't have been able to do that, but they, they clearly had um, the sperm fertilizing the egg. It was clearly a, a, a genuine offspring between the two different families, you see. So um, the fault is really in the man-made classification system. We, we try and do our best. In fact, here's the operational definition of the kind that we present is that uh, if they can hybridize uh, with each other, uh, whether fertile or not, uh, they're the same kind. And if two things can hybridize with the same third one, then all three of those are part of the same kind. That's the, that's the sort of a, a rough rule of thumb that we have. And in general, the, the family amount, the family probably corresponds to the kind in many cases, but not all. Because the man-made classification is not, not right. uh, consistent. I mean, humans seem to be a genus. I think all of the uh, most of the things uh, that are called Homo are probably uh, part of us. I, except Homo habilis seems to be a wastebasket uh, taxon. I'm not sure that's even considered valid these days. But I think it's Neanderthals, Homo sapiens, the Heidelberg, the the, the Denisovans. They're all part of our kind post flood right. people. Okay. Um, but well, then and, and Sorry. Well, I was just going to point out that's what's so um, wrong about the old Earth model, too, from reasons to believe is because we can clearly say, I mean, we've got genes from the Neanderthals, but yes. they want to say Neanderthals, Denisovans, um, Hadrobrakensis, like you're saying, they now have to say that they're non-human. 
because but, because of their model, yeah. you know. And now you see it gets even worse because um, he, uh, he has to say that well, okay, here's the evolutionist. Well, we, okay, we agree that humans and Neanderthals interbred. So he's saying, well, humans committed bestiality. That's what he says. Yeah, so that's. Like to document that he's really saying these things before he he, he denied that humans and Neanderthals interbred. That's not tenable anymore. So here's an excuse: the Neanderthals aren't humans, but they're beasts. But humans interbred with the beasts. Uh, so honestly, yeah, that's, that's what happens. Uh, yeah, it's it's uh, the article is by a friend of mine called Fred. Butler, and it's called um, oh, just sorry, I just a block there about uh, uh, old anthropology has gone real bad. Indeed, it's it's what results. When uh, with bad biblical hermeneutics like that, where now you have to say Hydro, um, Neanderthalensis is not human, and then all of a sudden the genetic data comes in that suggests we interbred with them, but they have to hold to their uh, compromised position. And it's even mm -hmm. bad for the evolutionists because what you're saying, there's there's all these definitions of, of species, but then there's mm -hmm. the accepted one, the biological definition, if you can interbreed. But I, um, I've been arguing with some of the Joshua Swamidas crowd that want to oh, say yeah. Neanderthalensis is a sister species, which goes against the biological definition of species because we know they interbred. So well, there's yeah. no consistency, you know? Yeah, these children, like, we know the children with composite features are so clearly they're the same species if they interbred. I mean, it's just a, a bizarre thing. But of course, in the biblical model, uh, the Neanderthals and Denisovans came from after the flood, after the Babel dispersion. That's why um, if they've forgotten how to build a, a city, they might have to build it in a cave, but they were still very intelligent people. They could, um, they buried their dead, they made musical instruments, they... Um, it made cosmetics, which required quite sophisticated chemistry. They made a super glue. That's what one secular report described as making a high tech super glue. That's on the Anatols, the stupid, silly Anatols, as, as you people have uh, us believe. Um, and, and Ross has really gone down the, the, the hole there. Because, again, another thing is how do you deal with the Australian Aboriginals? Have they been here for, for 60 million years old? It seems at, at one time, Ross was saying Adam might have been, you know, say 30 thousand years old aboriginals were sixty thousand years old so how could they have come from adam right how right. could they be saved by jesus the kins and redeemer who is the last adam because a kins and redeemer must be related to those he believe who, whom he redeems by blood there must be a blood relationship if jesus is our kins, kins and redeemer that's because all of us come from adam the first man but if you abandon a literal adam you have to throw away the kins and redeemer and you have to throw away any idea of evangelizing to the aboriginal people right well well while we're on the aboriginal people um I, i've read uh, articles that suggest that they've been around for sixty thousand years uh, but they also have um uh, a flood a flood account as well and yes, um, we, 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 oft, we often hear that uh, the Bible plagiarized the flood account from the Gilgamesh oh, yeah, epic yeah. Uh, story. Does that mean does that mean because Aboriginals uh, were here at 60,000 60, years, does that mean Gil, Gilgamesh actually plagiarized it from the Aboriginals? I wonder, don't you? It becomes uh, uh, quite bizarre when you, when you have a Maori people in New Zealand who also have a flood legend. I mean, uh, one expert in the Am the Amazonian native tribes, they found that all those native tribes had a flood legend. It's all over the place. But as yeah. you get away from the real flood legend, which is in uh, in, the, in Genesis, uh, it becomes more and more distorted. As you find the Gilgamesh epic has a lot of parallels with it. Uh, as you go further away, the parallels become less and less. Yeah, yeah. Sort of wrote about, the Gilgamesh epic a while back. Yeah, that's an important one. But I think the issue is that Gilgamesh, Genesis is the original, and Gilgamesh is the copy. Right. And one evidence for that is the design of the art. But the Bible has three dimensions. You have, um, if it was it's a, a fifty. How many? Oh, I'm to, sorry. Oh, I've got a little block here. Three hundred cubits long, fifty wide. 30 high okay so three different numbers to remember when it becomes a legend it's easier to remember one number than three so the gilgamesh epic has a cube arc with only one dimension to remember but a cube's a stupid thing to make a boat out of because it will capsize it's too hot top heavy 
while the uh, the biblical ark was actually found to be incredibly stable. It's probably the, the most stable configuration you can, you can make is the biblical ark dimensions. So clearly the, the Gilgamesh is the, is the copies. There's only one dimension, not three. Anyway, a stupid thing it is too. From an engineering point of view, um, yeah. I mean, most, most modern tankers are built to those ratios as well. So, you know, even modern modern uh, designers found that uh, the biblical uh, dimensions are the most stable for uh, for those big tankers. Well, you we see, see the danger. The yeah, exactly. The danger is actually the breaching wave. The, bre the wave hits it on the side and tries to and caps try and might capsize the boat. But because the arc is so long, we tend to align with the wave directions, not um, perpendicular to the wave direction. So. Um, one reason for the length of the arc is to stop the breaching wave, but also the arc's very wide, so even a breaching wave would be incapable of capsizing the arc. It's just that stable. And that's, as you say, why uh, modern tankers are built the same way. Barges on rivers were often built to the same proportion. Again, it's almost impossible to capsize them. And as, as I keep saying to people, uh, the, arc, the arc was built to float, not to mm -hmm. circumnavigate the world. Exactly, and, yes. Totally yeah. true. Well, what... Wasn't it Ross in your book too, Refuting Compromise, where he tried to say that a global flood would just destroy the ark? And and I remember reading you dismantling that. It seems like that'd be based on a lot of assumptions that a, 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 the ark could not survive a global flood. Essentially, I think is what he's saying. Well, what what's the assumption? But how come these Korean naval architects actually did some modeling of uh, of building different? ships of different proportions and find the arc was almost impossible to capsize even if he had a wave uh, three times bigger than a tsunami it wouldn't have capsized the arc okay the tsunami was at 30 feet high um, and if he had a wave 100 feet high it still would not collapse the arc right yeah and also see that deep in the ocean you had the, the tsunamis are very low amplitude deep in the ocean it's only when they come up on shore that you have the, the, the huge amplitude of the tsunami uh, incredibly destructive but i assume the ark was already carried away uh, out to sea before it got through these problems so, so deep in the ocean um, the disturbance would be quite minimal even when the the flood is destroying the earth eroding everything depositing things and also eroding things burying everything um but out but no would be quite Quite safe in the deep ocean from all that. Seems like more grasping at straws. Uh, Dr. Sarfati, I think this has to do with when we were speaking not only on the word yom, but also on the dome and how the compromisers want to say that in the ancient Near East, they believed we live in a dome and essentially a flat earth. Does this... The, the, does this question or objection make sense? Or, uh, yeah, I, I know this person. Oh, uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've tangled with this guy before. Okay, now the thing is, I, I said earlier, I, I quoted William Lane Craig about this. Well, the Babylonian astronomers knew the planets and this moon moved independently from the fixed stars. So they, it can't have been a, a stationary um, dome they're talking about because you wouldn't have this independent movement of things between it. So clearly they, they regarded uh, space as a, an expanse that things could move freely between. You see, they, they knew that things moved through the expanse, not with right. the expanse. Okay, so uh, I think people don't give enough credit to the ancients. There's always this idea, chronological snobbery. Um, ancient people were so stupid they didn't understand science, so therefore they got these things wrong. And even when it comes to the um, to the word rakia, uh, is derived from the Hebrew raka, which means to stretch out or to expand. So when you have a noun derived from the verb, the noun rakia derived from the verb raka, it, it means that it's the verbal force that's talking about it's talking about the expanse of space it's not talking about the material it's emphasizing the action of expense uh, expanding or stretching out so it doesn't mean a dome it means an expanse you look at the modern translation they say expanse not not firmament because that's what, what, what the hebrew is talking about and right, it, it doesn't talk about a flat earth either i mean uh, another um myth that was invented by the 19th century um, atheist now you have people like John Bolton parroting this nonsense, unfortunately. It's interesting how you've got the Waltons and the highs of the, wor of the world uh, basically parroting arguments made by 19th century skeptics of the Bible. And yet now you have supposedly evangelicals parroting those anti-Christian, anti-biblical arguments. 
Yet in many cases, when the Bible talks about the earth, it means the land of the earth. Okay, Genesis 1, the word of God created the heavens and earth. When it's contrasted with heavens, it means the planet earth. But then you have day three of creation week. God created the, had the land rising up uh, out of the water. And, you, and God calls the land earth and the waters the seas. Okay, so after that, mostly when earth is bench, it's talking about the dry land earth, not the planet earth. And that tends to, to undercut a lot of the arguments for a flat earth when it's only talking about the planet, it's talking about the, the, the lands, the land surface. So a little Dr. article Th that, uh, Dr. in the uh, comment. Dr. 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 Safari, we, we've invited that particular person okay. on a number of occasions to right. uh, dis discuss um, those issues uh, in a live discussion, but... Um, mm -hmm. He seems uh, happy to play the uh, keyboard warrior and stay behind mm. the scenes. Oh, yeah. yeah I've, I've counted them before. I think on one of our videos. Also, I think on that uh, dreadful um, inspiring philosophy, uh, that yes. was a job of, of, uh, on Genesis by the, in that group. But also he came onto our, our um, videos before. Yeah. Well, you nailed it, Dr. Sarfati. It's a lot of parroting going on, especially mm. with your folks such as Inspiring Philosophy. They're just parroting arguments from Walton, Heiser that have been dealt with over and over and over again for, you know, 15, 20 years. And, and I know that for a fact because I've spent considerable time reading mm. through as many articles on, on your website as, as possible. Um, well, I mean, can I miss a point of the flat earth? You see, uh, if the Bible really taught a flat earth, how come almost no one in the church taught a flat earth? Right. I mean, he, even the Jewish uh, Josephus clearly uh, took the Greek cosmological model, and he talked about a chrys the, the crystalline spheres around a central spherical Earth. That's what Josephus taught. Uh, almost everyone in the church who discussed the issue discussed uh, said the Earth was a globe. And when you go to Thomas Aquinas's Summa Theologiae, he he thought about the, the globe Earth as something obvious that everyone would know. This is in, the, in about twelve. 1250 thereabouts mid 13th century though now columbus's voyage was end of the uh it was 1492 right then you have thomas aquinas writing in 1250 that the the global earth is obvious i mean he used it as an example of something really obvious that everyone would know here's the global earth and let's see physicists know it's round by one means mathematicians by another means it's obvious i don't have to go into the detail because you guys know this as well as i do what he's saying there if the yeah. Bible called a flat earth and Thomas Aquinas said we mustn't undermine the Bible, but the Bible is authoritative, and yet he understood the earth, the earth to be a globe. Clearly the Bible doesn't teach it. Otherwise, why does no one actually see that they're this in the Bible until 19th century skeptics were trying to find a, a way of, of undermining the Bible? Dr. Safari, we've been going for uh, just over two hours, but before oh, wow. we sort of wrap things up, Mm -hmm. uh it, it is it is time it's flies doesn't it uh, yeah i'd like to I, ask, didn't, uh, I didn't even realize it time is <laughs> <Me neither. laughs> every time you're on dr sarfati it's like it's been fun, though, you're yeah. an encyclopedia oh. of information sometimes i feel bad because we're just throwing question after question at you but i feel like i've when we have you on and, and other like dr carter for example as well mm -hmm. i feel like we've got your entire website here where you know because you guys just have so many it's so much information just just ready to convey to us so uh yeah uh, over two hours so one, I, I really want to emphasize the fact that i appreciate your time that but you've i've given got one it. question though uh, uh standing right. before yeah, George, uh, go ahead i, I apologize yeah, for interrupting yeah yeah uh, like Hugh, Hugh, Ross, okay, yeah. Uh, Hugh Ross has scoffed at the adaptations needed to take uh the plant eating animals into meat eating animals post the fall is this a, a valid criticism of the young earth creationist model? Well, I mean, again, again that's something I, I answered that in my book, in Refuting Compromise. I went into a few ways that uh, uh, previously herbivorous things can become carnivorous using the same things they had. I mean, if you've got a claw like a panda and sharp teeth, you can use it for bamboo or you could use them the way uh, a polar bear does for totally uh, a carnivorous diet. They're, they're sort of um, hyper carnivores. And the grizzly bear is sort of um, uh, omnivore, can do by either the meat or all the, the, the 
the roots and berries it does, does both you see so same sort of if you looked at them in the fossil record you think oh there must be carnivores but we know for a fact they're not all carnivores and you think of things like the bird of prey called the oil bird it's totally vegetarian the palm nut vulture is a bird of prey but it's mainly vegetarian it eats palm nuts okay um the piranha has a relative called the paku which is a totally vegetarian fish but again the powerful jaws and teeth are there so you can find some things that maybe um what happens uh, after the flood is that things weren't as, as nutritious as they were, well, actually after the fall, actually the fall is a big discontinuity where things became carnivorous. The flood is where humans became carnivorous. The, the animals were already doing that, okay? We know that from the fossil record now. Okay, the, when the fall happened, God cursed the ground. So plants were no longer as nutritious as they were before the fall. I mean, broccoli is proof of the fall, okay? Yeah, we, we've recently observed, mm. um, I believe, shark, sharks have been mm. uh, seen to eat kelp and seaweed. Yeah, sharks are totally things. Sharks, for goodness sake. Yeah, that's true. I mean, yeah. certainly the, the, the continuity of the carnivore and the herbivore is really not as clear people like to make out so i'm going to uh, have a link here from our creation answers book it goes into several ways that uh, herbivores can become but also talks about things like uh, how could bacteria and viruses become bad bacteria because you know that most viruses and bacteria even today are good but okay, when you look at the, the bad ones, often they are degenerated forms of the good ones. Like a, a leprosy, the one which causes leprosy is actually lost about 80% of its genes compared to the animal, that, the, the bacteria, but it doesn't. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I love that answer too to the viruses and bacteria. I wanted to point out that our last interview, so many good responses from you on these uh, most common objections and questions that. Uh, we've been able to make a lot of good clips specifically on, on some of your answers and they've helped my own personal friends and family, especially in this time that we're living in when it comes to like viruses and bacteria in um, a, a young earth creation model. You gave such a good answer that I, I've been passing around that clip oh, to family and, 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 you know, they all have the same response like, wow, you know, we never thought of that. We never thought that, you know, viruses and bacteria are, are beneficial for the most part. And you, as you pointed out, a lot of the bad bacteria are uh, degenerated forms of, of the good bacteria. So, I, yeah. I, 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 heard, I heard recently that uh, a human body has um, many, many more bacteria than they have uh, than the human body actually okay. has cells. <laughs> and and yeah. I think uh, multiple times more uh, viruses. And someone made the comment that, if all the viruses were exterminated from our body, we'd probably last a day and we'd go extinct. Exactly. That's, that's definitely true. We, we'd be healthy for a day and we'd die. Yeah, it's, it's pretty uh, uh, bad. About the numbers, I've actually got a little on an article. I wrote it about vaccination. I've I put a little box in there about some concepts and terms. And the point is, see, a 70 kilogram man has a little bit more bacterial cells than human cells and about 10 times as many viral cells as bacterial cells. Because so viruses have a very important role in regulating the bacteria in your gut. Okay. So, I mean, I some figures for you in the article. Okay. 70 kilogram man has about 3.8 basically 38 trillion bacterial cells and 30 trillion human cells and probably about um, 300 trillion viruses. You're on the right yeah, track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, can I, can I share a few uh, laughs with you, Dr. Sfati? i start closing down a bit, it's all right, because it's... Uh, but I've mean, I enjoyed talking to you guys, definitely. <laughs> so, so have I. Uh, 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 this is a, a neutron walks into a bar and asks, how much for a whiskey? The bartender oh, yeah. smiles and says, for you, no charge. Oh, my goodness. I like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good way to end it. Oh, um, no, no, yeah. wait, wait, wait. There's okay, one, more, one more standing. Yeah, what, do you do one more standing. what do you do for a dead chemist? You bury him. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, for those people in the audience that that have never been in a lab in a high school, I think most of us have. But uh, mm -hmm. this is how you you recognise which class you're in. Okay, mm -hmm. if it's green and wiggles, it's biology. Mm -hmm. If it stinks, it's chemistry. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't like work, it's physics. 
That sounds about right. It brings back memories for sure. Yeah. Well, once yeah. again, I want to say, uh, Dr. Sarfati, you've given us more than than uh, enough of your time. I mean, both interviews have gone over two hours. And to me, I feel you've completely dismantled the old earth and, and theistic evolutionary positions. So uh, great job to you, um, Dr. Sarfati. And thank you to the audience for so many great questions, feedback, super chat, super stickers. And George, thanks for uh, helping out with this discussion. No and I want to give Happy it to New Year to you, Jonathan. Yeah, good to you. Thanks to you guys. Have a great 2021. And God bless you, mate. God, God bless, bless you. you guys too. Okay. God bless you. God bless you.